of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, September 16th, 2021. My name is Emma Vigeland in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Dave Zirin sports editor at The Nation magazine and author of many books, including his latest, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. Meanwhile, booster shots continue to divide experts at the FDA as the Biden administration tries to authorize them starting next week for Pfizer. The WHO and other international organizations have pleaded with wealthier nations, don't okay booster shots until poorer nations get some. The nation hit a deadly milestone yesterday. Over two-thirds of a million people, over 666,000, have now died due to coronavirus in this country, meaning one in every 500 U.S. residents have died of COVID-19. Conservative House Democrats on the Energy and Commerce Committee have sunk a proposal, at least temporarily, that allows Medicare to negotiate lower drug prices, saving the government money. And one of those Democrats, Kathleen Rice, has a spot on this committee after leadership kind of tilted the scales to keep one Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez out of that slot. This is a part of the larger fight over infrastructure where conservative Democrats are also apparently going rest, growing restless and angry at Pelosi, who promised them a vote on the bipartisan bill on the 27th, but Mansion and Cinema bogging down reconciliation in the Senate. Yesterday, four U.S. gymnasts testified on the FBI's mishandling of the investigation into Larry Nasser in deeply moving testimony about their abuse and government inaction. More on that in a bit. And lastly, Biden, as a part of his pivot to China, has announced that the U.S. will help Australia deploy nuclear-powered submarines giving the U.S. a military presence in that region, or at least by proxy, and of course, escalating a conflict for the sake of it. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. We have a great show for you today. Obviously, I'm very excited to talk to Dave. Um, we pre-recorded the interview before uh, this broadcast today, and you'll get to see that. I loved our conversation. He is very busy. That's why we had to pre-record it, because his book is taking the world by storm. Um, but I'm thankful that he took time out of his busy schedule to speak with us about this. Because, as you know, I'm passionate about politics and sports, and one reflecting the other. And I think we have a really great conversation about it now this is a bit of a darker topic um but also involving sports yesterday four american gymnasts testified in front of congress including michaela maroney simone biles my understanding is she's considered one of the greatest gymnasts of all time by many people about the fbi's failure to act adequately on serial sexual abuser and pedophile Larry Nasser, who was the U.S. gymnastics team's team doctor for 18 years, where he used his power to abuse countless girls. I think the advocates say he abused over 120 now women, um, but I think one of the victims was six years old. And I think that wasn't an, an anomaly. I think a lot of these girls were quite young. <laughs> and many of these women, now women, are high profile because they are a part of the, the, the gymnastics teams. They've won gold medals. 
and they use their power to talk about the FBI's complete dereliction of duty, although I would argue it's part of a larger FBI pattern um, in this testimony. Now, Nasser was sentenced to 60 years in 2017 after another time where the emotional burden was put on these women to testify publicly about the abuse. Um, he is going to spend the rest of his life in jail. Um, uh, he's going to die there. That There's no question about it. But this brings up larger questions about the FBI. Here is Michaela Maroney going in and ripping into the FBI, totally understandably, about their reaction to the statement that she provided for them. Yeah, she, just to clarify, she um, came to the FBI in 2015. Yes, yes. Um, and he was sentenced in 2017. So she, I think, was 19 at the time. Is my she just she and she hadn't even told her mother about the abuse. And she said she spoke to the FBI. She talks about telling them this incredibly traumatizing experience, telling them about that on the floor of her bedroom. Um, and here she is ripping into the FBI for how they reacted to her statement. Be molested by Larry Nassar. According to the OIG report, about 14 months after I disclosed my abuse to the FBI, nearly a year and a half later, the FBI agent who interviewed me in 2015 decided to write down my statement, a statement that the OIG report determined to be materially false. Let's be honest, by not taking immediate action from my report, they allowed a child molester to go free for more than a year. And this inaction directly allowed Nassar's abuse to continue. What is the point of reporting abuse if our own FBI agents are going to take it upon themselves to bury that report in a drawer? They had legal legitimate evidence of child abuse and did nothing. If they're not going to protect me, I want to know who are they trying to protect? What's even more upsetting to me is that we now we know that these FBI agents have committed an obvious crime. They falsified my statement, and that is illegal in itself. Yet no recourse has been taken against them. The Department of Justice refused to prosecute these individuals. Why? Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco couldn't even bring herself to be here today. And it is the Department of Justice's job to hold them accountable. I am tired of waiting for people to do the right thing because my abuse was enough and we deserve justice. These individuals clearly violated policies and were negligent in ex executing their duties. And in doing so, more girls were abused by Larry Nassar for over a year. To not indict these agents is a disservice to me and my teammates. It is a disservice to the system which was built to protect all of us from abuse. It was a disservice to every victim who suffered needlessly at the hands of Larry Nassar after I spoke up. Why are public servants whose job is to protect getting away with this? This is not justice. Enough is enough. Today, I ask you all to hear my voice. I ask you, please, well, that was incredibly powerful, and part of the issue is that the FBI is not here to protect us. The FBI is here to serve U.S. hegemonic interests. Yeah, the New York Times reported on this yesterday, and they characterized this as a remarkable turn where Christopher Wray acknowledged the agency's mishandling, but all he does is say he's sick that that happened. Uh, he's very apologized. I'm so I'm sorry that so many people let you down again and again, so many people meaning FBI yeah, agents. Yeah, people uh, who I work with, my, my buddies who I uh, go to the water cooler with. I'm especially sorry that there were people at the FBI who had their own chance to stop, like a chance, like it was like um, like a carnival game. It's a, it's a Hail Mary. Um, a chance to stop this monster back. Again, the FBI agent using a, a loaded term like monster when it was a trainer that they failed to stop um, back in 2015 and failed. And that is inexcusable. It should never have happened. And we are doing everything in our power to make sure it never happens again. Now, the guy who uh, just said, is that it? And then sat on the report for a year. He was fired two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also we have things like Mr. Ray said that, uh, oh, 
Um, Mr. Ray said that as a result of the Nassar case, the FBI had strengthened its policies, procedures, systems, and training, including emphasizing that its agents report. This isn't about training. This is about yes. Like, this is about um, protecting powerful people and organizations from uh, investigations. And, and two, just like the ripple effects of that, which is where who who the FBI tr treats seriously because of the structure of that organization. And you know, there's going to be a lot of bad faith analyses by this from the right wing i mean i can already see tucker carlson's segment on this i don't even know if he did it last night but um oh this is some sort of like signal for q it's the deep state protecting pedophiles right try to steer away from that because what matt said is key this is about protecting powerful people and that is what the fbi has done throughout its entire history it has protected white supremacy it has protected government officials from um from activists and from criticism it has killed activists and it has tried to maintain capital and it has tried to, and has done so quite effectively and it is that's all a part of this toxic stew of protecting the powerful and this is one of a variety of instances that you can point to historically in which they did that and so they're not going to go out of their way to listen to a 19 year old victim crying and giving her testimony about the sexual abuse that she faced because that's not in the tradition of the FBI. They are not crusaders. They are not the cartoonish portrayal that like, you know, was put out in the 1960s to say, oh, they're defending our freedom. No, they are there to protect the powerful, and that is how that institution is structured. Yeah, I mean, uh, Leahy had the right quote, which is, a whole lot of people should be in jail, not just one guy fired. A whole lot of people should be imprisoned for this criminal negligence. And, I mean, until something like that happens, uh, you know, we can get as many apologies and, oh, this monster, and I'm so sorry that we missed our chances. Yeah, give me a break. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we will be joined by Dave Siren. Thank you to Aura for sponsoring today's episode. Aura is giving my audience 40% off when you go to Aura.com slash majority. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash majority. Look, think about all your online accounts. You got finances, you got devices. What are you doing to protect them? Because if you're like most people, like me, probably reusing your password all over the place. Actually, I try not to do that, but I do do that too much. And a data breach to any one of those services could create a lot of problems for you. Every 10 seconds, someone becomes a victim of fraud or identity theft, and a lot of these people never reco re recover their stolen money. All right, so let's talk about how Aura can protect you. Aura is a new type of security service. It protects your online data. It protects your devices with one simple subscription. You get alerted to fraud, you get alerts, uh, alerted to threats, and you get alerted fast. If your online accounts or passwords were leaked online, if someone tries to open a bank account in your name, you get alerted quick. It's got an easy online dashboard. Alerts are sent straight to your phone. Aura keeps you in control and guides you through solving any issues. All plans come with a $1 million identity theft insurance to help recover your stolen funds and experienced U.S.-based customer support that has got your back. So if you want to secure your online presence and you want to do so from hackers and from scammers, check out Aura. You're going to get 40% off all plans when you go to Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash majority. The link is in the YouTube and the podcast description. Now, back to Emma. I would like to welcome to the program, or welcome back to the program, I should say, the great Dave Zirin, sports editor at The Nation and author of many books, including the just released The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. This is right up my alley, so I'm excited to talk to Dave about this. Thanks so much for being here, Dave. Oh, it's great to be here, Emma. Yeah, so uh, your book is excellent. Um, I, you're, it's essential reading if you are interested in movements, if you're interested in Black Lives Matter, and of course, if you're interested in the politics behind sports, which both of us certainly are, and you've made your career on it. Um, and 
what I love about your book is that it's more than just about Kaepernick. It's quite literally about the effect. It's called the Kaepernick effect. And it's just chronicling this extraordinary moment in history where athletes in all parts of the country at all levels participated in this act of protest. I mean, just how monumental was this mass movement? In 2020, in the summer after the police murder of George Floyd, we had the largest demonstrations in the history of the United States, demonstrations that hit all 50 states. And I would argue that while many roads led us to that point, one of those roads runs straight through the playing fields of this country. And the language and method of the protests on those playing fields were really bequeathed by Colin Kaepernick and what he did. See, the Kaepernick effect, it, it's a language, it's a method. And so what I did was I interviewed all of these athletes who were already upset about racism, who were already upset about police brutality. But if you live in Storm Lake, Iowa, or if you live in Beaumont, Texas, it's not like you can walk out your door and go to a Black Lives Matter protest. But they saw through Kaepernick how they could bring the struggle to their community. And I wanted to write about them. I wanted to write about the fallout that might have taken place. And I wanted to write about it primarily because I was really concerned that these stories were going to get forgotten, as we so often do, not just in sports, but in discussions of social movements, the people at the grassroots who kept a movement going, and not just the great heroes that we put up on pedestals. Right. And, and of course, we should, I think, laud the bravery of Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed and other Kenny Stills. I think, you know, they're the most prominent NFL players who are at the forefront of this and the most vocal. Um, obviously, Kaepernick's a former NFL player because he was blackballed and we can get into that a bit. But um, the irony of the knee being this method that outraged so much of America just goes to show that it's not the method of your protest, it's, it's just that you're protesting at all because people don't realize this, but Kaepernick consulted with a former Green Beret, um, as, as we've discussed, about how to be the most respectful in his protest. Tell us a little bit about that background because I think it just adds another layer to an understanding that this was all about just racial animus and backlash when people were talking about oh can't take a knee in the anthem yeah i mean this story would almost be comedic if the results weren't so serious and it's if anything darkly darkly ironic uh in august of 2016 colin kaepernick was sitting on the bench behind his teammates in anonymity in protest of the anthem yet people got word of it it caused this just absolute tumult of controversy is tremendous backlash all over the he, place he was injured at the time right is yeah. my recollection right he, he was coming off an injury uh because of that he was backing up a far inferior quarterback named blaine gabbert uh whose name is perfect for this story it's like a dickens story like blaine gabbert is it doesn't get whiter than blaine gabbert and I, he's like wow, he's a journeyman i forget why I, I don't even know where he's backing up now but but right definitely inferior <laughs> just about guarantee he has a job somewhere because he's not Colin Kaepernick. Yep. Um, so Colin Kaepernick is just sitting and he wants to be able to hurt, to be heard. He doesn't like that the debates are about the anthem and about patriotism and is this against the troops. He wants it to be about racism and police violence, um, issues like qualified immunity. He wants that to be on the table. So he consults with the person you referenced, a former Green Beret and NFL player named Nate Boyer. And Nate Boyer came up with this idea where he said, you know, if instead of sitting behind your teammates, which looks disrespectful, how about if you take a knee in front of your teammates as a way of showing respect for the solemnity of the situation and also registering your dissent? And that seemed like a great idea to Colin Kaepernick. It seemed like a great idea to Eric Reed, his teammate. And so they started taking a knee. Yet that just turned the volume up on everything and it made the cacophonous voices of the hard right and the and trumpism at the time like even all the more violent and unhinged because they couldn't deal with the fact that that image of him being on that knee it became instantaneously iconic if colin was just sitting during the anthem on a bench that wouldn't have inspired the people that i wrote about in this book 
They wouldn't have said, gee, maybe I can sit on a bench too behind my teammates. There's nothing about that that's forthright, really. Um, and, but when they saw that image of the taking of the knee and all eyes gravitating towards him, that's really what inspired people because the people I spoke with, what they wanted above all else, it was so modest, was to start a conversation in their community. And they saw by doing this, they could start a conversation. Often they didn't realize the kind of real, the kind of whirlwind that they would be reaping, but that was their modest aim all the same. Right. Um, and I guess, you know, you talk about how it would be humorous um, if it wasn't so dark, this kind of effort by Kaepernick to, um, to make it more respectful. And I want to turn to some of the stories you tell about high school and college um, students in a bit. But you point out in your book the juxtaposition of Kaepernick taking a knee and Derek Chauvin taking a knee on George Floyd's neck. And that is another just poetic but darkly so kind of encapsulation of this struggle and um it it has almost retroactive resonance with this deeply um important moment uh, in the murder of george floyd absolutely and and you know and it doesn't take an americ american studies degree from columbia to see that juxtaposition um the protest that i went to you know people were referencing that on on homemade signs people had uh, images simultaneous with one another uh, that they had you know that they had glued onto placards i mean this was something that was obvious to everybody who was in the movement like just the image of the knee and the fact that kaepernick's knee and the knee of the people that I describe in this book were, were completely about trying to affect change in a peaceful manner. Uh, that's what it was about. Whatever one might think of pacifism or lack or, 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 or its faults, this was the goal. It was a pacifistic demonstration. And then to see that same posture be used as an instrument of murder. I mean, it was also for the folks that I spoke with, because I went back and then re-interviewed everybody after the protest started in 2020. I mean, for, for them, it was also like a, a really rough reminder of the violence that they faced when they took a knee. That far too often in this country, the response to peaceful protest is not peaceful counter debate. It's violence or the threats of violence. And so many of the people I spoke with, that was their reality. Not that any of them had regrets, far from it, but they had to face the specter that something could happen to them or their families. So then I guess let's turn to some of these stories that you told. Um, the opening, I think, story about a high school student named Rodney Axon Jr. really stuck with me. Tell his story for our audience. Yeah, I mean, in brief order, uh, Rodney Axon was from Cleveland. His parents, in an effort to get him a better education, moved to the suburbs of Brunswick uh, in, at a predominantly white school where he always felt like he had to watch his step and watch what he said and always felt like it was a, a very gingerly situation. And he thought playing football would be something that would provide him with a degree of acceptance. And on one level, it did, but it also meant hearing a lot of his teammates who were white uh, drop racial slurs left and right. And when he would raise objections to that, uh, they would say, oh, no, but we're not talking about you. You're one of us. And that stuck in his cross something fierce. Um, when you couple upon that, the fact that over the summer of 2016, you had the same thing that influenced Colin Kaepernick, the police murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Uh, it had just gotten under Rodney's skin to the point where he felt like he had to do something. And it, it might have just ended as an exercise in frustration and stress for him, and frankly, a degree of trauma. But uh, seeing Colin Kaepernick take that knee, it like it gave him a language and a method by which he could do something. He was like, yes, he'd already even been thinking in his mind about doing something related to being on the football team because it was just out of control. And so he took that knee and he thought it would be a way to just get everybody to wake up and say like, hey, look at me. You know, I'm not quote unquote, one of the good ones. You know, I object to your racism. Uh, but, you know, that did not click. Instead, he received death threats. Instead, uh, coaches, teammates, 
I mean, and he braved all of this, this incredible backlash, but it was scary. Uh, the violent threats were what were most scary because he had a little sister. He's uh, a high school, student. I mean... high school student. Imagine being a high school student and worrying that you might have brought harm and violence onto your elementary school age sister. And he felt like he had to walk her to school every day and she couldn't take the bus uh, precisely because uh, she was his sister in Brunswick, Ohio. And I'm sure people in Brunswick, Ohio would say, oh, you know, that's that's not us. That's, you know, the worst of us or whatever. But, you know, like Howard Zinn said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. So if you're not standing up for Rodney Axon in a moment like this, you you inevitably become part of the problem. Yeah, and, and you also chronicle peaceful protests in the vein of Kaepernick kneeling um, in other sports, which I want to talk about as well. But there's something just so unique to the American identity and psychology that comes with the sport of football that has like hometown connections that is both a national identity, say, you know, in Ohio, maybe as a Browns fan, but also the people in that community are fans of the high school team. And it's part mm -hmm. of a local identity and a national one and a uniquely American one. And I think maybe that is part of this rage that is exercised. Um, and of course, it's just all racism, but but. <laughs> But that's part of it, too, which I think makes the football aspect even more um, punctuated. Exactly. I mean, football, I would argue, is the closest thing to a monoculture we have in the United States. And when you look at the ratings of football games compared to other cultural products, it's ridiculous. And the Super Bowl might be the last thing that unites a national gaze, except for maybe a presidential election. I mean, this is where we are as a country, you know, very divided, very chopped up by both, you know, by, by the culture and our politics. And here is football, this thing that's supposed to be this instrument of community cohesion. And I would also add that because, you know, that this, there's been so much atomization in the workplace over the last several decades, the football field becomes almost like the last public square in a community. You know, gone are the the bowling leagues and the Elks clubs and things of that nature, or the, the union hall too, for that matter, in a place like Ohio. Um, but what you still have is this football stadium as a place to cohere your identity. And that also puts an absurd amount of stress on yeah. these 15 to 18 year olds. And you've you know, covered this sport. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you've covered sports for decades. Do you notice that that anxiety is heightened as the atomizations increased yeah. as of course you know parts of the country where football might be more popular um <laughs> they, they don't have the economic opportunities that there once were the bargaining power that unions have provided i mean do you have you made that connection throughout your reporting oh yes i mean high school football has always been part of the american vein in the american vein but high school football being a, a social and economic engine of a community, I mean, that's something that's much more with our 21st century time. And it's thrown everything out of whack. And it's not just high school football. I mean, we could have a, I mean, look at a school like Notre Dame, for example. I mean, when, when they start their football program a century ago, uh, it's a textile community where there's a small Catholic college that happens to play football. Now, Notre Dame is the economy of South Bend, Indiana and how the football program does has a ripple effect on all kinds of local businesses across the board. And there are no more textile factories in South Bend, Indiana. So we've seen a substantial change um, over the decades. And I've certainly even seen that in the last 20 years. So I guess that's a, a good transition to talk about college football then. Um, the I was very torn by some of the images that came out in 2020 of Nick Saban, the head coach uh, at Alabama. M most people consider him the greatest uh, college football coach of all time. I think that's fair. Linking arms with his players in protest as he is a multimillionaire <laughs> being paid in an institution that I've talked about on this show is one of the most reminiscent of slavery in its framework that we have left. Uh, these players put their 
uh, blood, sweat, and tears, sometimes injure themselves for life, can't play in the pros and get paid nothing, nothing as they rake in millions and University of Alabama can sell their jerseys. I mean, and Nick Saban, if he wanted to speak out about that, he could. He doesn't. He links arms with his players and protests in the wake of George Floyd. And at the same time, I don't want to be too cynical because as you highlight in your book, I wrote down this quote, which I thought was so well said. On college campuses in the 1960s, athletes were at times used to surround buildings that were occupied by student protesters in order to keep out food and supplies. Today, football players at the universities of Mississippi and Alabama are marching for racial justice. That's the, that's the positive. That's the positive. Um, and in a way we can read it as a positive that a Nick Saban or a Lane Kiffin feels under so much pressure to respond to the reckoning of racism in this country that they think that they would actually lose their team if they look like an old out of touch white guy to the point of which they're willing to march in the college towns of universities, of Alabama and Mississippi with their incredibly rich tradition of poison in terms of the history of the civil rights movement, Jim Crow and segregation. So to me, it's one of those sign of the times. Is it sincere? I don't particularly think so. Uh, if it was sincere, would they be speaking about the issues that you raised? Absolutely. But it's quite a sign of the times that they even feel like they can't play their traditional role of the authoritarian Bear Bryant coach saying my way or the highway. Instead, it's them saying, wow, there is such a racial reckoning happening in this country at this moment that I better show that I'm on the train because, you know, like we said, you can't be neutral on a moving one. Right. And I want to talk to you about ownership in the NFL, where some of these same um, patterns appear. But I don't want to move past college before talking about some of the stories of college players who who protested. Um, Dave, I mean, you, you told a variety of stories in your book, but which ones stuck out to you the most? Well, it's interesting because I talked to some football players and they, you know, the, the, those stories and that bravery uh, is because of the scholarships being renewed annually and the pressures that come with football um, on a campus, those stories stand out. But, but I think of a young woman named Mink who played lacrosse at a small college in rural Illinois. And those are the stories I really like because she uh, stood up to her teammates and their teammates really went after her afterwards. And it got bad enough that she eventually had to transfer schools, but still no regrets. And there's something, it says something about the potency of the moment and the potency of taking that knee that this is, you know, women's lacrosse at a small rural college in Illinois. And she caused an absolute upheaval. Uh, just by taking that knee, just by saying she wanted to talk about these issues. And I think when people do this, I mean, they, they reveal a lot of truths about a community that they otherwise would not want to see. And it takes a lot of courage to hold a mirror up to an entire community, which is what Mink did. And how did some of these college coaches across a breadth of sports respond? I mean, it's interesting. I, I mean, I found that the high school coaches were more likely, not always by any stretch, but were more likely to say, oh, you know, this is an educational moment. We need to talk about this as a team. We need to speak about how to support one another than the college coaches who tended to either openly or surreptitiously stab uh, people in the back. Um, stab their players in the back. I mean, or stab them right in the front. Uh, that was the really what, what I saw at the collegiate level. There, there wasn't that level of support. There was, interestingly, at the University of Nebraska, the biggest football school. I mean, the coach isn't there anymore, which says something. His name was Mike Riley. And he just happens to be a politically liberal person. So when, even though it, it led to an incredible backlash in the community itself, uh, the, his posture was, I love this, you know, let the players protest. Uh, they have my support. Shockingly, he's not the coach there anymore, 
I'm not saying there's a connection, but I think it's very interesting that the coach now there is former Nebraska quarterback Scott Frost and not, you know, West Coast, California, cool Mike Riley. Yeah, well, I said, you know, we were kind of moving more in chronological order in your book, but I want to return to the story of the Seattle high school coach who um, faced some repercussions as well. Joey Thomas, uh, the coach at Garfield. Uh, Garfield is a fascinating high school in Seattle uh, because it's the high school of Quincy Jones and Jimi Hendrix. So it's like this fulcrum of black culture that it still is. I mean, Quincy Jones donated a whole music center to it. Um, And yet this is a city, Seattle, that's ostensibly very liberal, that also has a very small black population in the city itself. Uh, And so a city like Garfield, the players start taking a knee, starts with the football team, just a couple of players. And Joey Thomas's response uh, is saying, well, I'm at Garfield. I'm in Seattle. Let's do this right. And so they had a whole team discussion about it. They spoke about the history of the national anthem, which is its own very ugly history. And they took a knee. Now, you would expect them to be applauded for this in a place like Seattle, like, oh, look, they're young, they're so socially conscious, but these young people learned something another person I interviewed told me, which is sometimes in the eyes of adults, the only thing worse for a teenager to be than apathetic is politically active. Uh, You know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And um, what Joey Thomas found was uh, his tires of his car got slashed, death threats came into the school, death threats to individual students, more students then started to kneel, like in solidarity with the football team, uh, whether in assemblies or, or, you know, the women's softball team, the women's soccer team. And I interviewed folks um, from these different teams to talk about how these issues connected and collided. But Joey Thomas eventually found himself out of a job. Uh, he had to quit. He had to quit because the level of harassment was so intense. It's just unbelievable to me. I mean, it, it like th- to to waste one's energy on getting that riled up about a an act by a high school sports team. But I I I, I feel like it's we're seeing a little bit of it in this kind of masking debate where parents yeah. who project their own anxieties onto their children and talk about indoctrination and get energized to the level that's unhinged in um, kind of trying to bump up against what's happening in schools and what's happening with young people, which for them represents this anxiety of, oh, this, I don't understand this, this is new. And it's causing me to maybe think a little bit harder about my relationship with racism and with black people. And, and so that's how it manifests, I guess. Yeah, whether it's masking or what they deem to be critical race theory, which seems yes, to be talking yes. about slavery, <laughs> it all falls under. Or the in root. Texas, it's just a black principle. A black principle. He's just uh, black. <laughs> yeah, just the the crime of being black and uh, having a white wife and putting picture of yourselves on Instagram. Ah, so you knew that story too, right? It was so repulsive that it seeped its way through my computer into my mind. But it's it's interesting because um, I was asked by another uh, interviewer something that it was sort of sort of in the spirit of what you just said, which is, you know, do, do these stories make you optimistic or pessimistic? Because I can see why one would draw pessimistic conclusions from some of these like, my God, you take a knee and your tires get slashed. You take a knee and you're worried for your little sister's safety on the way to school. But I came out of this book more optimistic because the people, for lack of a better term, the people I spoke with were happy warriors. You know, they'd been through so much, but they felt so good about the people they were becoming. And they saw what they did as being part of that process that it was just difficult to not be carried along on this like wave of, of cheer and hope for a different kind of a future. Well, uh, let me drag you down into pessimism when we turn to the pros, right? (laughs) Because the older we get, the more pessimistic it gets in terms of the age of the people that uh, we're talking about. Well, exactly. And and you see that like manifest itself with the children in schools who are on the right path and the parents Mm -hmm. of them slashing the coach's tires. So uh, the parents are the ones, the older folks populating the NFL. And of course, the 32 owners are very white, very rich. 
and were instrumental in keeping Kaepernick blackballed and out of the league. We we know that, um, and that's been well documented. He settled and got we don't know the number, but a significant settlement from the NFL because he was a, his team was at least able to prove that there was some evidence of collusion, which is a very hard bar to clear. But the NFL owners were disgusting enough that they were able to do so. Um, but I guess let's just start there with what we saw at the NFL level in the wake of, of Kaepernick's kind of explosive protest. Um, at the NFL level, you saw some players being, I, I would describe them as Kaepernick curious. Like a lot of players in a lot of rock locker rooms, and this would be from my direct reporting of talking to these players, every locker room was in a discussion about what Kaepernick was doing. Every and that means they were not in a discussion about you know whether to play a zone or man to man defense in the game that Sunday. So what you saw was a break from the kind of authoritarian business, you know, work harder, uh, you know, it, life is tough, no one cares attitude that is the National Football League. Um, and you saw instead players debating and discussing racism and how best to respond to it. And I think that scared the holy heck out of an NFL franchise ownership and a total executive class, too. If we want to talk about general managers, executives, almost entirely white, uh, this is not what they wanted to see. So since then, they've adopted uh, this carrot and stick approach to their own players. Uh, the carrot is they'll have a social justice committee that operates through acceptable parameters. The carrot is they'll put decals on the helmets, right end racism in the end zone. The carrot is Roger Goodell will even say, as he did in 2020, why jeepers, maybe Colin Kaepernick was right to want to talk about these things four years ago. My gosh, golly. But the stick is Colin Kaepernick, not on a team. Eric Reed, not on a team. Kenny Stills not on a team and it's this message that they're sending to young players that you better stay in line or you could end up like these other guys on the outside looking in so i want to contrast that response with the nbas because you talk about how they write end racism in the end zone and like you, on the back of the helmets they get to pick if it says black lives matter or end racism express yourself individual individually with these pre-picked phrases these corporate decals <laughs> yeah exactly um and the nba did something similar but mm -hmm. the nba is just better and more progressive and they listen to their players and i wonder you know what you draw that to because one i mean i do think it's leadership a little bit with adam silver just being a better person than roger goodell i think it's the nature of the sport and the culture around the sport but also like i mean is it just is it player leadership or the culture that cultivated that kind of leadership yeah it's a ton of different factors i mean first and foremost it's just the very existence of a black lives matter movement uh but then you know what it comes down to is that the best player arguably in league history lebron james decided that Whoa. he was going to say something. I know. Ooh, that's wow. the most wonderful thing said in this interview. One um, of two. One of two. We, you know. I'll throw one of three because I'm a Kareem guy. Too. I was about to say, I, I could see that, Dave. But yeah, anyway, keep going. That's, there's a lot of biases there. But um he's the man. With, with LeBron, I mean he was playing in Miami when Trayvon Martin is killed in 2012 in Sanford, Florida. So that that you know, hit the team very hard, especially when Zimmerman was not getting uh, a Trayvon's murderer, George Zimmerman was not being arrested. Remember, there was that period where they weren't even arresting him. And so, you know, this is a, a wild number, but you know, over 50 high schools in South uh, Florida staged walkouts. Another story that gets memory hold about that time. Uh, one high school, they spelled out Trayvon's name on the football field with their bodies. Uh, but the Miami Heat knew about this because it was in all the local news. We're just not remembering it historically. And so LeBron said, we have to do something about this. So they all posed with hoodies in 2012, the entire team, because hoodies being the symbol of what got Trayvon killed. And th that was the, really the first viral sports politics photo of the Twitter age. And I think that taught a lesson to LeBron that 
by using social media and his own avenues, he could fulfill his dream at, when he was a teenager of wanting to be a political athlete like Muhammad Ali. So LeBron in turn bends the league towards being more, more, for lack of a better term, progressive and more open to what its players have to say, because he also provides this force field for any other player that wants to be political, because how can you come out, come down on the last player on the bench if you're not going to come down on LeBron James? It really is quite remarkable because he was said to be, you know, the next generational talent from age 15 on, right? And was caught, not coddled, but I mean, had this rarefied experience that only he could understand it's an it's a basically a, an audience or or a group of one and that's got to be very disorienting and um i would imagine you start kind of smelling your own farts to, to, to some degree and so that that you know of course that's going to affect you but he still had the perspective to put political activism at the forefront and i i, I remember being frustrated that you know uh, by some of his political speech, but on the whole, it really is, it, it's pretty impressive to, to keep that, you know, yeah. mooring. The, the LeBron story is a fascinating one because, and this is what makes athletes over the last hundred years, black athletes in particular, such a dangerous and volatile element in the workings of, of U.S. society and you know the bit daily functions of us inequality uh because a lot of them like lebron come from extremely poor backgrounds michael jordan did not come from a, michael jordan came from a stable middle class home uh and i think that's one of the reasons that affected his desire to not yeah. be political because they were never part of uh the aspirations of his house you know collective action but here's lebron you know s single mom very poor uh, until, you know, people started to realize that he was going to be this talent. And then, you know, money, I, no question was put in their pockets, but, you know, but until he was 15, like knowing what hunger felt like, and, you know, that's something that really never left him. And it's why he's done the educational work. It's why he's done the voting work. Uh, it's why he's spoken out against police violence and his willingness to put it on the line. I'll say it again. It, it bent a league in a direction that it was not otherwise in. And then we can return back to the NFL, right? Where there, there has been a shift. And I remember when George Floyd was murdered and a group of players, including Mahomes, including my boy Odell, uh, including a variety of other, uh, you know, great superstars in the league came out and rebuked the uh, commissioner and basically said, this is not enough, which right. was very different than how NFL athletes are taught to be. You are a soldier. This is a militaristic operation. The uh, Bill Belichick is judge, jury, and executioner, although apparently behind the scenes is a lot more player friendly than he puts out uh, publicly, but I digress. Like it's, it's just a very, it's a very, it doesn't it's not a fruitful environment for that kind of um anti-authoritarian we're gonna use our own power we're gonna use our own platforms and that was a huge shift in my view yeah just brief note you know i did that book with michael bennett former nfl player and he played briefly with the patriots and he really liked uh playing for belichick because he uh, said they all say that yeah that he leaves you the hell alone if, if you do your job right and yeah far too many coaches they want to know what's happening in your personal life you know basically they're treating 28 year old men like like children and that really rankles a lot of players a lot especially and which which players do they go after more i just i couldn't i couldn't can't yeah. figure that out right yeah because because there is a racial dynamic to that yes. about having this older usually white coach treats you like you're something of less than less than an adult and uh and so they like belichick because like i said he leaves you the hell alone as long as you do your work which is really all you can ask for <laughs> maybe not just in football but in, in in life um but i'm sorry what was the question i got caught in belichick land i i guess i was just talking about the 2020 rebuke by uh mahomes oh yes Saquon yes. barkley the odell yeah. right yeah. yeah i mean mahomes I mean, let's see what happens, but he's the closest thing to LeBron that you have in the National Football League. I think if Mahomes 
isn't in that video and not, he wasn't just in the video. He was an organizer of the video. If Mahomes is in that, isn't in that video, every player in that video, including Odell is at risk in terms of their NFL future. Well, look at how they responded to Odell doing the 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 black power fist in in the Kaepernick era, right? I mean, yeah. uh, distraction, distraction, distraction. Uh, you know, and, and then part of an absurdly lopsided trade that gets him off the Giants. I mean, just mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ridiculous, ridiculous. Yeah. And, and it was it was done absolutely for political reasons, not because for playing reasons. You know, that's my team, Dave. Right? So you're opening up some old wounds. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm sorry about that. I don't know if you did. You ever hear the New York Giants 1987 rap video for when they were going to the Super Bowl? You should look that up on YouTube. It'll it'll haunt you. Does LT does LT spit? He doesn't appear. Too cool. Oh, all it's right. It's all your linemen with their own <laughs> hip hop stylings. Yikes! Yikes! <laughs> the 80s, so fun. <laughs> um, but but you needed Mahomes in that video. He can cast the force field. He is the one player in the NFL who is absolutely indispensable at this moment. Uh, hopefully he'll use that, uh, that power because it, it, like LeBron shows, it can make a big difference. And lastly, I just don't want to leave without talking about the dynamic that mirrored the one we saw in college football of owners like Jerry Jones, who's also the general manager, um, which is rare. Uh, who, who, who prides himself on having relationships and building relationships with the players on the Dallas Cowboys still like for months and months, trying not to talk about the anthem. Oh, they can kneel, but not during the anthem. And only when Trump called them sons of bitches did all of the owners, they went down on and linked arms and they knelt with their players, but the protest element, what there was actually being talked about completely washed away all they cared about was that the president who jones donated money to um a a lot of money uh and many owners did uh not john mara the the they uh that that he he went after you know their the, the their employees that was essentially what it was and they wanted to do something and and that that really frustrated me yes and fear that they would lose their employees. The NFL so much depends upon the acceptance by players of rules that are racist, that are anti-union, even though they're in a union, that are unfair. The fact that the contracts aren't guaranteed, the fact that that NFL owners held back scientific information about concussions, so there was no informed consent for what players went through for decades. Uh, you know, there, there are so many reasons for that we might see a player's revolt or even a player's league, like some offshoot. And so the importance of keeping players pacified uh, became all consuming after Colin Kaepernick started to raise a lot of people's eyebrows and saying, wait a minute, do we really need to accept things the way they are? Because Colin might have been talking about racial inequity and police violence, but once one player starts bucking the system, it raises the possibilities. The old expression, courage is contagious. It raises the possibilities and the horizons of everybody else in the league. And not just there, but in all of sports. If you want to talk about why the rules in college athletics have loosened up over the last year, or why the Washington football team felt like it had to change its name after decades of defiance and clinging to the racism of its moniker, it all dates through Colin Kaepernick taking that knee. Yeah. Um, and I, I hope for a variety of things where players in the NFL, you know, seize their power. And one of them is you know, the, the CBA has already been agreed upon, but eventually contracts that aren't so exploitative because people don't realize they only focus on the stars, the players that bear the brunt of this, the players that had the most to lose by protesting on the bubble of the roster, their average career is very short and they don't have guaranteed contracts. And this is their time to cash in, to set them up and their families for life. And the NFL exploits them to, to a great degree. So, um, Anyway, that's just something I wanted to make sure people understand. Yeah, it's all part of the picture of understanding why we can't divorce politics from sports. Yes. That is absolutely baked into it. And when you hear your neighbor or your father-in-law say something like, well, I don't like politics and sports, you know, just remember that what they're saying is that they don't like a certain kind of politics with sports because there are tons of politics and sports that they're perfectly fine with. 
Dave Zirin. Uh, his book is called The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee, Changing the World. I really appreciate your time today. Everyone should go out and buy it and read his stuff, The Nation, where if there's you know a big sports story, you'll you'll usually have some uh, some take on it that's very much on point uh, and well and well said. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Emma. We are back. I hope that everyone enjoyed that conversation with Dave Zirin. And, um, you know, Dave's a wonderful progressive. And, you know, just reading some of the IMs here, I think a lot of people have criticisms, and I understand. They don't understand how um, one can enjoy a sport like that and be progressive or have consistent values in that area. And... I've always tried to advocate for the players in that instance. And I also do believe that not every moment of your life is going to be abiding by leftist principles unless, you know, you're a vegan. Hats off to you, right? But we do have to operate in these spaces as leftists or it becomes a little insular. And sports are a huge part of our culture. Yeah, and you can't give sports to capitalists. It's ridiculous. You can't. Um, and it's important to have these conversations in order to stymie that kind of influence, to increase player power, collective power of these players who are often black against these white billionaire owners who have been the kingmakers for so long. And that's why the Kaepernick protest was such a monumental moment was because was because it was about players seizing their power and that was a part of the pushback to it there was capitalism involved because the players are just supposed to do their job and entertain and Kaepernick said I'm not going to do that and that pissed off a lot of people with a lot of money and a lot of racists too so all of these things are intertwined but that's all we have uh, for today in terms of time for our Peacock audience. We will see you tomorrow. But for everybody else, we're sticking around. Um, People are saying there's yeah. a contradiction uh, because you claim performativity is wrong that you support Kaepernick. And I would just say there is a massive difference. And I don't think you are uh, uh, fundamentally against all types of performativity. It's like, what is it actually doing? Yes. And I'd say there's a big, big difference between Kaepernick and, I mean, let alone the yard signs, but even what um, happened at the Met Gala, and not to relitigate that again, because I feel like way too much time was spent on what was probably a neutral <laughs> event. <laughs> right. Mind. But, um, like Kaepernick literally did something on a like football is a propaganda vehicle for the ruling class and to like I mean this is, we all just know this stuff Dave Zirin's talked about it as good as anyone about the flyovers yep and um, American propaganda and so that type of performativity to counter a certain type of um, performativity by the, like the Pentagon literally yes. funding the NFL I think is an entirely different class. And people don't realize that that type of performative performativity where the jets fly over and the national anthem is sung and everybody stands at attention, that wasn't always the case in NFL games. I believe it started during the Gulf War and was a part of a push by the Bush 1 administration, if I recall correctly. But... Um, I think the other thing I'm seeing in, in the chat is that CTE is a massive issue in football, and that is something that's also uh, a, a contradiction. I would say that it's also, like, that's why I advocate for players' rights. Yes, of course. The problem with CTE is, like, if players... It's a problem of hiding medical facts from yes. laborers. If the players were in complete control and they could make the decisions themselves about how much risk they want to put their bodies into, then they would allow to do it. I mean, we don't ban MMA. Even, I don't watch it personally. I think it's disgusting. Yeah. But like people are allowed, to, and I, I don't know what the, let alone look in the CTE things there, but that the problem isn't that like it's a brutal sport. I'm sorry. It, the problem is the... Um, exploitation of the people who actually put on this, the show. Right. Um, and if 
there was adequate collective bargaining and players were able to make these risk assessments for themselves and their contracts were guaranteed, um, that would be a different story. So uh, now we are letting in Matt and Brandon, hopefully put that a little bit to rest. I know that there was some controversy, but you I know. also just want to say I'm down with ownership groups. Right. No more owners. Wow. We've only got one group in the NFL, the Green Bay Packers, that are owned um, by the fans, and that should be more frequent throughout the league. It should be either the municipalities or the players or a combination of both. And then you uh, don't have, like, say, the Oakland Raiders get up and leave for Las Vegas because there's a brand new stadium there and they can make more money. Yeah, like the capitalists, the capitalist involvement needs to get out of here. That's what's... Yeah, that's why the 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 whole. Uh, anyway, we, we could talk about this forever. Hey guys, hey Matt, hey Brandon. Hey. hey, let's talk sports. Can't wait. Let's do it. Well, we just spent the whole first hour on that, so I think Aww. we'll probably have to leave you out of this conversation. I know that's probably breaking your heart. Very disappointing for me as well. I just want to put that out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I knew that I'd be dealing you guys a blow, but hopefully I can make it up to you by allowing you to promote your podcasts on the show so gracefully i might add and seamlessly transitioning into that as well Mm -hmm. i know i'm a professional very good i I guess i'll go first let's let's do it all right so uh folks uh i i was you know short story i was uh just recently just this week demonetized on youtube i'm being censored whoa ladies and gentlemen my free speech rights are being curtailed, so I need your help and support uh, by subscribing to my YouTube channel, I guess, youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Um, no live show tonight because today is my significant other's birthday. Oh. Uh, to make up for that, though, I did a live show last night, which you can catch on the replay. And uh, it's on youtube.com slash Matt Binder right now. Go check it out. And Brandon, what's happening over on the discourse? We actually uh, are just about to post our 9-11 20th anniversary uh, memorial episode where we talk about, you know, the pre-9-11 landscape, the post-9-11 landscape and sort of like that 20 year time and how it changed America, pop culture, you know, social uh, structure, et cetera, et cetera. You know, from a more personal lens of me and my co-host or my co-host and I rather uh, all have being of different age and being sort of like at different stages of our life when that was going on. So I think it's a pretty interesting episode. Yeah, it sounds it. It sounds serious. I don't want to oversell it because, you know, it it kind of starts off with a really inappropriate joke. So, okay, well, then uh, as is the way. And then that sort of that tone kind of continues throughout the entire thing. So I just want people to be prepared. Okay, so not serious at all. Got it. It depends Uh, on how serious you take the topic matter. Well, uh, that's a good point. Matt, uh, what's happening over on Left Reckoning? Uh, last night on Left Reckoning, we had Darna Noor on to talk about Entergy, the climate-denying public utility that is currently failing New Orleans, including uh, how they planned with a third-party group called the Hawthorne Group to stack public meetings with uh, actors and Uh there's emails saying we don't normally recommend this because people wonder like hey where do all these people i don't recognize come from uh but it'll be sixty five hundred dollars for ten people and uh the (laughs) the entergy ceo said this is war we need all uh hands on deck and uh, we'll take more people if you can get them so we talked about that we also talked about bitcoin and Ooh. the ghoulish way, yeah, Bindi, you'd like this. The ghoulish way that Bitcoin boosters like to travel around the world and find tragedy and suggest Bitcoin as a remedy for that tragedy, for instance, in Palestine or Afghanistan or wherever there's people dying or being oppressed. Uh, and we talked about that. And also in El Salvador, we recently heard a lot about how Bitcoin's going to solve the remittance issue for a country that really relies on remittances. And in fact, it hasn't turned out that way and it's a big disaster. <laughs> Quite, quite the opposite, along with the disaster that's going on where people are literally protesting in the streets and uh, one of the bi- biggest Bitcoin critics in that country was arrested uh, mm. on a shaky, shaky for shaky reasons. Mm. Um, the remittance actually uh, is not true. In fact, now that it's rolled out there, uh, remittance fees are less are less when not dealing with Bitcoin because obviously Bitcoin fees exist too. 
Right. And it turns out that, like, Bender, I'm sure you agree with this, that the only reason they were talking about remittances is because it was a nice way to sell a product that they want the uh, value to inflate <laughs> so they right. can sell higher. I, I right, saw this right. being circulated the other day. Uh, BitcoinMagazine.com had an article that says, can Bitcoin bring Palestine freedom? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they have a lot of those. And a lot of those articles are written by someone who is an executive at yep. that uh, quote unquote human rights foundation, yeah. uh, which is one of the organizations that were uh, very much a part of the coup, uh, supporting the coup that uh, uh, through uh, Evo Morales, Evo Morales out of office in Bolivia. Um, they had hired um, the young woman who I had a uh, debate with on my show, who was a uh, strong critic in that country of uh, Morales, and she claimed that she was not supportive of uh, Janine. Uh, oh my God, what's her? Inez. What was her name? Uh, yes, uh, Janine Inez. And uh, then after she uh, swore up and down she had no allegiance to her, uh, a few days later, after I spoke with her, she uh, appears on her Instagram with a photo of the two of them together, saying how proud she is to stand with the first Bolivian woman president. That's uh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we talk about that's Alexis Gladstein, uh, who writes those articles, and he writes yes. like, yeah, decolonial stuff like that. And I, I was sickened to find that Humans, Human Rights Foundation connection, too, because you notice he's not talking about Bukele, uh, right? Mm. Um, no, absolutely about- not. Yeah, and you would think somebody with a human rights portfolio would be have an eye on that, but he's more concerned with boosting a uh, boosting cryptocurrency, and that that is something that deserves more scrutiny going forward. You know, and and you hear Bitcoin Magazine, and you assume, okay, this is a you know, obviously they cover crypto, and they probably have like a you know a more positive view than the rest of people, but it's still a news outlet, right? I just want to be clear, <laughs> Bitcoin Magazine is straight up like a propaganda arm for Bitcoin. It is fully like a outlet that only talks positively about Bitcoin and pushes it and promotes it. I mean, there are cryptocurrency uh, like news sites that obviously uh, look at it in a you know in a manner that's more positive than you or I, but they do critique where it fails. Um, that's not the case with Bitcoin Magazine, so I wouldn't trust anything that comes out of that uh, that outlet, if you can even call it that. All right, the leftist infighting continues. Bitcoin Magazine versus the Majority Report. Uh, well, they're not leftists, so don't I, I'm joking. Sure, I'm, I'm being sarcastic. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the. Oh, uh, check out Nomi's show. Um, AM Quickie, all that good stuff. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back, back. I just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflake says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. bring back to DJ Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Time. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason 
why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. My birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 pussy. back we are back and we were just saying in the break that we've got some great clips today and it's kind of a slower news day but great really funny stuff unhinged clips i don't know i don't want to step on anyone anyone's toes but i think we should start with the joe biden clip oh okay sure um well we'll talk about this later Uh, it's a joke Uh, you're not stepping on my toes regardless uh everyone's supposed to laugh at that that's fine um (laughs) wait wait can you explain that joke I don't know. We'll yeah, talk about I'm, this I'm later. Because you're like, I don't want to step on anyone's toes and then pretend you'd be pissed at you. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm. All right. I, I, I still don't get it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't humor me. I mean, we'll see some great acting with Dave Rubin later, so we can put that Oh, my God, time. yes. <laughs> we got so much good stuff. I'm excited. Right. I, I can so, barely hold it in. I'm bursting at the seams like the Oogie Boogie Man. <laughs> um, I guess we'll start here. President Biden had a teleconference with Boris Johnson and the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison. I know his name because I'm reading it. Biden does not seem to know his name. As he's cutting off this call with the Australian PM, uh, as uh, as well as Boris Johnson, he tries to kind of jujitsu his way out of saying his name, and it's very inartful. Thank you, Boris. And I want to thank uh, that fellow down under. Thank you very much, pal. Appreciate it, Mr. Prime Minister. I uh, I'm honored today Thumbs to be up. joined by. That was that was very artful. I thought that was great. That fella down under. Let's do it one more time. That is. He should so have called him mate. He should have said mate. <laughs> he should have put on an accent. Thank you, Boris. And, and I want to thank uh, that fellow down under. Thank you very much, Val. Appreciate it, Mr. Prime Minister. I uh, I, I love, love that because this is I a part of it. this this conference. I believe is about the fact that we are expanding our reach in the in in the uh, in nuclear capabilities. We are providing um, giving away some subs. Yeah, giving away some nuclear powered subs, and the emphasis is it's not subs that have the capacity to hold nuclear weapons, but subs with nuclear power uh powered by nuclear uh, energy and it's really just a way for biden to pivot to china now that he's gotten us out of afghanistan he's got to get us involved in some sort of other cold war conflict because you know the pentagon can't sit idly by twiddling their thumbs and uh in the midst of this big pivot to china press conference in which we're trying to arm and shore up our white colonial trifecta with the uk and australia by giving australia sphere that is right. not a club you want to be in yeah uh he forgets the prime minister's name yeah i mean that is like the concern here is um the anglosphere orienting its pointy objects towards china uh biden kind of defangs that concern a little bit when he can't remember the guy's name <laughs> May, may, it must not be that important. May, it may not be that big of a priority. Maybe the Pentagon's planning for the next president to be yeah. the one that <laughs> takes this. Listen, he ca- he called the guy prime minister, whereas he just referred to uh, Boris as Boris. I mean, the respect was on the Australian prime minister's name, if you ask me. 
Good I think point. given, you know, the way Boris Johnson looks, it's really hard not to just call him Boris because he kind of looks like he has that look about him of like a Guy Ritchie villain, right? You know, Boris, that Jason, yeah. That Jason Statham has to like axe kick it to death or yeah. something. He's and got a little case that he shouldn't have and Statham needs to go retrieve it from him. He, he's friends with Biff in Back to the Future. Biff and Boris, it's the spinoff. Can we, uh, can we get the clip one more time? I, I just... Yes. Third time's the charm. Maybe he'll remember I mean, this time yeah. around. Look, this Listen, is he could have been stuttering over the guy's name, trying to remember it, recall it, but no, he, he just knew right oh away. Oh my God, you're standing for Joe. And he played it off. I mean, he played it off, but I don't know how well he did. Thank you, Boris. And, and I want to thank uh, that uh, fellow down under. <laughs> thank you very much, pal. Appreciate I, it, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, I, uh, I don't think people pick it up because I also didn't know or really care what the prime minister of Australia's name was. And even after hearing it, it still kind of sounds kind of fake, like Scott Morrison. It sounds like, you know, it sounds Who's like a little, Scott? You know. Scott Morrison? I can't say, it's hard to say in an Australian accent. Listen, they've been, they've been locked down in Australia for so long, I doubt any of them even remember their names, all right? So, you know, it's fine. Pass on Joe Biden. <laughs> Cracky, I love that guy down under. What a shell you are, Bender. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Biden. I love this from Biden. Really, this is like. Listen, I gotta say, I've been, I've been, uh, you know, he, he's made, uh, he's not perfect, but I gotta say, uh, he's uh, especially with uh, his, the way he uh, held strong and steadfast on his Afghanistan withdrawal. I'm, I've been impressed. I've been impressed. Uh, there's areas to critique him on, but uh, you know, all around, it's been better than 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 worse, to be quite frank. From a purely aesthetic standpoint, if you have to disregard any prime minister in the world, you know, it's hard to pick a better one than the Australian prime minister. You know, it's just though just a complete lack of respect from our for our friends down under is what I'm seeing from Biden. Just like when he ignored the prime minister from UK's calls than when he was pulling after Afghanistan. So, you know, right. honestly, I can't say uh, you know, he's not being the diplomat I want him to be. He's just not, you know, anything else I need. That, that, that's the thing is like just speaking purely purely on a comedic uh from a comedic standpoint um we did lose some like trump was funny president to watch in in cases we didn't yes. lose so much though biden is funny in kind of the same way and he just d d d doesn't have Stephen miller working for him yeah right right that's a you know that's a great point we could still get the same unintentional hilarity just without all the uh like the a geriatric hatred. head of state <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, we know that Bender loves that with Pelosi. I do. I, you know, that's just, that's, well, you know, I, just I, think I, I don't, a, I, I don't, un I don't ironically like Pelosi. I, I really do. Yeah. Again, um, from a purely aesthetic standpoint, I think that there's nothing more appropriate for a crumbling late stage capitalist state than just like our doddering gerontocracy. So, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is, would, it is artful. Yes. You know, I think um, that if nothing else, Obama was better than America deserved as its sort of front man. It was better than America deserved for that. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, you know, remember when Trump, the most famous of when Trump couldn't remember someone's name and it was Tim Cook and he called him Tim Apple. Like I'm imagining, you know, we could, I guess the only thing that would have been better if, he, if like Biden was like in uh thank you, uh, Johnny Australia or something like that. That, that would have been good, I guess. Yeah. Even yeah. during the debates, I only remember Biden ever saying like two names in that way, well, maybe three, Putin, uh, Bernie, and then, uh, oh my gosh, now I'm forgetting the third name. It's, it's infectious, but no. And also uh, G and everyone else, even the people on stage with him would be my friend or, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And he would even true. forget like what their qualifications were sometimes. And so, you know, that's just Relatable. a Bidenism. If you, like, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's what it is, I guess. So and speaking of charming. comedy, let's let's turn to this um, because again we have a million amazing clips that I don't want to fall down uh, or, or that, that I want us to get to. Um, Grant Stinchfield on his show Stinchfield seems to have lost his stench a little bit. Uh, <laughs> he had a veteran on to talk about the Afghanistan evacuation. And look at how unhinged his reaction is when this veteran Joe Sabo mildly critiques Donald Trump. 
I can tell you this, this didn't happen under President Trump. And I know there's a lot of people on the left that want to try to blame President Trump. He wanted out of Afghanistan real bad. He was real frustrated not being able to get out. But he didn't pull out because he knew this would happen. In fact, we all did. I called it on this program. My 12-year-old son knew about it. And so um, I've got Americans there that are stuck. To me, that's a hostage situation. But, Joe, I appreciate yeah. you working to get them out. I really do. Yeah. And I wish you with all due, luck in the with world. Due respect, Thank you for uh, with due respect, Grant, I mean, like, veterans, you know, uh, being one, right, and our friends are over there. Um, right. We followed this closely from multiple administrations, and we know the uh, Trump's I'm, administration's efforts here were fairly weak, yeah. that they were trying to limit the number of people that would get out. And Joe, so there was coordination problems. Joe, I'm going to cut time. you. I, I'm already, uh, I'm already weak. I'm already low on this? time, Joe. Already Joe, weak. Joe cut him off, already please. Weak. Cut him off now. Cut him off now. <laughs> You're not going to blame this on President Trump on my show. That's not happening. Now, I appreciate the work that you're doing. God bless you for being a veteran. God bless you for trying to get Americans out. But don't come on this program and take the talking point to the left and blame President Trump. That's not helping anybody. The Biden administration screwed this up from the very start. You know it. I know it. The country knows it. And to call them not hostages, I don't know how you don't call them hostages. They're stuck in Afghanistan with a country overrun with terrorists. <laughs> that are willing to kill them all. Oh my God! I'm mad about that, man. I really. We know. Am. Yeah, man. All right. Finally, we'll slow it down, because we've got a real hero coming up. That man's a real hero too. He's so. <laughs> <laughs> that guy is himself. working. That guy is working Order. right now to help evacuate Americans from Afghanistan, well, and he's just hostages. like, yeah, right. Look, it, it I, you know, I don't, I don't hate see veterans, but they need to learn to check themselves. Is what the message here is. <laughs> uh, veterans back... should be seen, not heard. That's that's the important thing to remember. <laughs> yeah. This is America, yeah. sir. You know, they're they're and that's not only Stinchfield or whatever his name is. No, it's that's his name. It's his conservative. It's conservatives as a whole. They've backed themselves into a corner here because their whole like their whole facade is there is no holier opinion than that of a u.s veteran and they're discovering that not all u.s vets toe the conservative line and when they mm. come across those they are backed into a corner and we saw this with stitchfield yelling at the guy while also trying to like sneak in words of respect and he almost he almost screwed up there at the end with, yeah with the, he with definitely that. screwed up you know what he could have used uh stinchfield could have used that button that they used to silence biden except to silence that veteran that wasn't completely in lockstep with his uh with his anti-Biden pro-Trump stance, like they've got to start more widely distributing those buttons that shut off Biden. Right. Anytime someone, anytime someone goes on Newsmax to complain about being uh, their free speech rights being taken away or being canceled or being deplatformed, should follow it up with a clip of Stinchfield yelling to get that U.S. veteran off of his show right now. Well, you know, it's funny because you don't often see it when the right, you know, parades one of their like uh, heroes or, you know, chosen, uh, you know, veterans, because like they are obviously going to be representative of the veteran population in one sense. But we know a lot of veterans do come back home anti-war or pro-peace for obvious reasons, because they get exposed to the military industrial complex and also the horrors of war. And so like for them to now finally be forced to like basically give up the goat that like, no, no, no. We're only interested in the opinions of a very small slice of veterans, obviously, though, uh, is something that, you know, I don't think we've seen before quite so, I mean, uh, vigorously, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Yeah. I, and and I mean, do we have that, Bradley, where the, uh, the right when the vet says, um, you know, Trump was weak and Stinchfield loses cuts his it off, yeah. absolute mind and the vet. Or not vet. Uh, the Stinchfield says he's so mad and he's thinking about how he called Trump weak that he says I'm weak himself. Yeah. Um, do we have that, Brad? Well, yeah, also, rage. let's point out that the guy, the guy, literally, his organization, the veterans organization, is literally called Team America. I mean, it doesn't get any more over the top patriotic things that conservatives love than that. Yeah, and what's crazy too about this whole like let's have veterans on to discuss the Afghanistan withdrawal, mostly what's happened is that the mainstream like cnn msnbc <laughs> types they try to have them on and be as like 
incredibly respectful as possible and often they have them on to talk about how why we probably should be still engaged in afghanistan um but then you go on the most like supposedly veteran loving program possible in newsmax and he's like screaming at him and cutting him off imagine if the shoe was on the other foot we wouldn't hear the end of it let's do uh, let's play that one more time brother do yeah. and i wish you all with, due, re with due respect thank you for uh, yeah, with due respect Rand, i mean like veterans you know uh, being one right and our friends are over there um right we follow this closely from multiple administrations and we know the uh, trump's I'm administration's efforts here were fairly weak yeah. that they were trying to limit the number of people that would get out and joe, so there was coordination problems joe i'm gonna joe i'm gonna time. cut you I, i'm already i'm already weak i'm already low on time joe <laughs> i'm already weak i'm already low on energy i know so that's when he says yeah when he says weak weak i'm already low when he says weak, you know, like, that's exactly what triggered him. Yeah. You know, my strong man that I love is not weak. Like, He's strong. If there's, <laughs> if there's like, one thing Newsmax does not want to happen, it's for a guest to call Trump weak. Yeah. Like, if there's I'm... one word, do not call Trump weak, or they'll hit a button and you'll be gone. Oh, right. Well, I should say they do have, they, 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 they kind of have that button. Yeah. I mean... I just hate to say that Greg Stinchfield canceled that poor man live on air, but at the same time, it's such an interesting like visual dichotomy because you have like the veteran who's already like this hero in American mythology. He's just sitting there. He's wearing his like plaid fucking flannel. Uh, the tattered shirt. hat. It's, it's like, like out of Chucker's it, hat. It's like, yeah, it's out of a, Americana. it's out of a movie. It's the new Matt know, Damon movie. Right. He basically <laughs> has like a, you know, he drove his pickup his truck mouth. to the studio. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have like this guy in an ill-fitting suit with, you know, again, vaguely British uh, villain looking like yelling at him about he's how he's not patriotic enough and he should instead be, you know, much more like him and Donald Trump, the two real patriots. Mm. Let's read some IMs. Maybe <laughs> actually Stitchfield kind of looks like the guy who, uh, who the neighbor who uh, blows Kevin Spacey's brains out in American Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> oh chris cooper chris cooper yes. uh, that's actually kind of on point um <laughs> little ricky rack it up <clears throat> wrap it up he lost his stench hilarious m thank you um uh da -da -da. Gigi Palin, Bender, I refuse to let you be left out of sports conversation. You should know that last week Hassan came to the realization that he truly loves the world of professional wrestling. Just thought I'd put that out there considering your encyclopedic knowledge of the ki king of sports. Yeah, well, okay. I, I gotta reach out and see if I'm getting on the, yeah, doing a stream. Bender for Biden says, I'm a proud Biden sexual. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's the ring of death. I gotta own it now. Just Democrat. like the just like the Pelosi stuff. Mel Blunt says, I'll say it again, Emma needs to ingratiate herself onto Sports Talk Radio, become a regular caller who's a cool chick who knows her stuff, only eventually turn the tables on, say, Boomer and Geo with some good political takes because Dave Zirin isn't ever going to... Shoot, I lost it. There's a lot of IMs coming through. Um, but yeah, I, I, with all my free time, I'll do that. Uh, I, I wish I had the free time to call into Sports Talk Radio, but... Um, That's a good way to get on Matt Walsh's uh, radar. Mm hmm. Because yeah. Become like a, a, a woman uh, sports newscaster. Then he just yeah, comes at you with the fury of a thousand sons. Yeah. Feminized sports. Right. I should I should tweet that at him. Um, Bor Bourbon socialist saying everybody in America knows that this is Joe Biden's fault right after angrily melting down and cutting off the person who is contradicting that notion. The right shows they are the real snowflakes once again. Mm -hmm. North Dakota nurse, thank you to Matt for bringing up the news from ND on Majority Report and Left Reckoning. Hearing that Matt was from North Dakota drew me in as a listener, and he, Michael, and all of you at NMR Universe have been incredible in shaping my politics. Matt has mentioned a few times that North Dakota death rates from COVID haven't been that alarming during this current surge. That is because we really just now are starting to see our cases start to spike. Recently, yeah. I was coming to our infectious disease doctor about COVID numbers, and he predicted our peak in deaths to be coming later in October because deaths lag a while after cases start surging. So stay tuned. Thank you all for you do, you do Emma and MR crew. You're yeah, amazing. I should take the opportunity because I had been saying like Florida's deaths are going crazy and other states haven't been, but actually the other states are catching up with Florida now. I think um, Texas's recent death uh, spike is as high as anything last year and some of the other uh, states around there. So it, it isn't just Florida. I was holding out hope that maybe it was just like this special maybe climate plus 
um, demographics of Florida, but it looks like we're in for another. Uh. I mean, it's it's impressive how compared to New York, like New York's death rate have not gone up really at all yeah and despite cases going up massively it's because it's just we're so vaccinated <laughs> it's because of vaccinated and probably some mitigation measures too yeah um black marxist glenn greenwald is what he is but watching taibi and harper are just sad uh i, I thought I, I honestly i honestly thought uh I, I mean i don't know what the context specific context is here but i thought that um taibi went uh that way well before Greenwald, honestly. And so Taibi's move didn't surprise me as much as when Glenn went full on that way <laughs> to mm. the right. I feel the other way a little bit, but anyway. Yeah, I don't want to get bogged like, down. Glenn, I that. feel like, has just returned to form. He's, Glenn's, like, clearly watching all of our shows a lot, so he's tweeting about it. I mean, today. Glenn is going above and beyond in this guerrilla marketing campaign that we've uh, tasked him with. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the contract <laughs> ran out weeks ago, and he's still going at it. So yeah, I appreciate he's... all the, the, the views. Emma, you don't want to talk about how cool you were in middle school? Yeah, well, I mean, he's he's... <laughs> He seems very concerned. Uh, I will. Uh, I, I will assure him. I, I don't have trauma from that time. But uh, I thank him for his for his concern. Um, you want to take a call, Matt? Let's do it. Let's go to the phones. Let's uh, let's grab the first call right here, and that is eight four seven. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. What would you like to talk about? Okay, but that didn't answer your question. I'm still from the Chicago suburbs. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I called a little while ago asking about what y'all think about different kinds of sanctions against oil and gas companies in Myanmar, and I was appropriately reprimanded for citing only Human Rights Watch. I had some flashbacks to college of citing sources, but uh, I would like to offer some other sources, uh, and I will email this to you. I emailed this to you on August 5th, thinking I was going to call then, but then I didn't. Ah, uh, so I probably so I give you all about it. No problem. So the question is, should there be sanctions of a type that I still think don't haven't yet happened uh, to uh, against uh, to try to prevent revenues from oil and gas companies that are headquartered in you know rich countries uh, from going to uh, you know the government of Myanmar or related entities. And, uh, you know, I think we're always suspicious of that stuff. So I wanted to mention some groups that appear, you know, I have no special experience. I don't work in any social movements or anything, but uh, some groups that Jacobin seems to respect and uh, People's Dispatch seems to respect. Uh, so there's this group, the Confederation of Trade Unions of Myanmar which I think is the same thing as the, it's had a couple different names, but the Confederation of Trade Unions of Myanmar, they had, uh, Jacobin spoke to them. They called for something they refer to as comprehensive sanctions against the government. You know, mm. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, and I will email you links about it to try to All demonstrate right, so that it's not on its face a terrible idea. And that's right. just invite a discussion of whether it's a good idea in the future. Definitely send those uh, articles. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert. I don't think anyone else on this show is an expert on Myanmar, uh, frankly. And due to the, uh, you know, the the coup situation there, uh, it's a very specific to that country situation. So I don't know if, you know, the usual opinion on sanctions w are, are, are accurate for, you know, the one that we would have for other countries. But uh, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Who knows? Uh, send those links. We'll we'll take a look what some of the experts think. Appreciate Green the call. Of France too. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Phil. All right. Let's go back to the phone. I'm gonna take one more call. Being that was so quick. Uh, let's go to uh, random. I'm gonna pick one at random. Uh, seven seven three. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey yo, this be Uchi Wally, man. Uchi Wally. How are you? What would you like to talk about? Um, I've been calling into the show since its inception. I've called in since the first month when it was founded. And I normally talk about politics or uh, the content of the show in a positive way. But for the first time, I'm I'm just outraged at what I heard during the Dave Zirin interview. Oh, I, I'm, I, well, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm wiping sweat from my brow being that I wasn't a part of that. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, nothing Level to do with you. I've got to I've got to take this shot at Emma. Um, 
As oh, people no, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm happy that know. the shot, your first critique of the majority board is leveled at someone other than me. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I adopted the name Uchi Wally to make fun of Michael, may you rest in peace, um, because of his uh, love of Nas. But uh, before that, I called in as Blaine from Chicago. And uh, I don't appreciate the insinuation that the name Blaine is the whitest name ever, which I believe is a direct quote of what you said, Jeanette. <laughs> <That's Indy. laughs> and uh, I'm, I must I'm say, Uchi Wally, I, I feel a sense of relief that that was the critique. I, as as a black man, I don't appreciate that. You know, there's a black woman now, 87 years old, born in 1934, Georgia, the height of segregation, and has seen some pretty effed up stuff in her life is willing to name her son Blaine. Then well, you know what? White name. I retract I retract my claim that Blaine is the whitest name ever. Um, how about On the other hand, you can the defense you should use is he named me after a white man. So <laughs> okay, I was gonna say is there a story? I um, will I will say that it's certainly no wider than Brandon. And I you know I like my name. I think it rolls off the tongue. Even though, you know, my mother first heard the name on 90210. I've known. That's fine. I've known other black people named Brandon. I don't think that's a white name. It Brandon was very popular when I was born uh, in 1991. So like mm. it was the I think probably because of 90210. Uh, so you know. I think was, Brandon like is whiter than Brandon. Shout out to Brandon. Brandon is definitely whiter than Brandon. I try not to acknowledge the name Brandon when I'm talking about my own name because I think it forces people into a conversation where they think it's the same name. And I mean, not a Brandon. Wait, is Brandon not here anymore? No, He's not, here anymore. not we a Brandon. We have Bradley now. Just yeah, that's, that's what. That's the way. Bradley's pretty it. white, but Bradley is not fully white, so there's that. At the end of the day, though, no, I mean, no. I, now none of these names are white because white people are naming their kids like Braxton and like uh, Kaylee with yeah, like, like seven Y's and Kaylee like with like six I's and one E. And yeah. a Q and like a heart on the I. Right. Yeah, I, the, the, they're letting you do that on birth certificates now. All right, well, Uchi Wally, thank you for uh, your criticism. I always appre one, appreciate constructive criticism. One quick thing. I, I always just was really interested in the quarterback situation in in, uh, in San Francisco because as it just happens, my middle name is Colin. Mm. So their they're, they're starting quarterback had my middle name and their backup quarterback had my first name. And I just always just – I didn't think that was an omen or something but it just seemed like it maybe it was but i couldn't figure out what it called your so, attention um, yeah, at the very I, least yeah yeah thanks i enjoy the show and uh please don't piss me off again i'll try not to <laughs> bye appreciate Forgi it forgive her her name is emma I yeah mean. that's pretty white that's pretty white and i was named after a white woman my great grandmother so there's that um all right, all right. You want to well, get, you want to get, get, I, I want to make sure we don't miss this one because I, I saw, I honestly did not know about this clip until I saw it on the sound sheet and then I immediately had to take a listen. Okay. This, this Daily Wire clip where apparently they have a show called like Daily Wire Backstage or something where the five main faces of the Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Clen Clavin, or whatever his name is. Yeah, they sit around and perform masculinity. Yeah, and, they is talk the guy's about name Jeremy Boring. Yeah, the guy's name is Jeremy Boring. One of them, right? Right. Yeah. So they sit in a, a circle, very masculine, with their, you know, with their legs crossed on leather couches and seats, and and they talk about culture and whatnot and masculinity. But this one, apparently. Uh, I have not heard this before, but did you guys know that Barack Obama is responsible for the death of rock and roll? Let's play this clip. Well, rock and roll is a public health question. <laughs> rock and roll is over. <laughs> You're still talking about rock and roll as though Barack Obama didn't happen. Honestly, it's for another day, but Barack Obama destroyed rock and roll. You have convinced me of this. There I was guess. rock and roll, then there was Barack Obama. Now there yes. is no rock and roll. Yep. Because, so he because, did something good. But because <laughs> rock and roll... <laughs> <laughs> rock and roll was about white male angst. <laughs> oh, he just said it. Angst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Barack Obama came along and said that some better black music. Yeah, yeah then, really. Well, Barack Obama <laughs> came along and said white, white young white men aren't allowed to have angst. Yeah, they're not allowed mm -hmm. to uh, to basically express their dissatisfaction because they're so toxic. Toxic. Yeah. And so, uh, truly, rock and roll just stopped. Yeah, I'm yeah, right. right. 
Yeah, I was like, you could just substitute rock and roll for, you know, like white supremacy, basically, or whatever. I mean, it, rock and roll was not about white male angst when it came to be. Rock and roll was about a bunch of white people ripping off a bunch of black artists, stealing their style and their songs and reappropriating Which, it. Good for, for Ben Shapiro. For for ben Shapiro points out, yeah. He yes. Really, he really remembers Back to the Future. I mean, you got to give him credit for that one. <laughs> I don't know. I I think it's more the take that he's got to play up his uh, intellectual bona fides, and yeah. you know, rock and roll is still for that 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 group. You know, it's 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 lower music to them, and you know the the classics from like jazz musicians who are you know trained musical artists. You know that's so he's got to he's got to stand but for them. I think that's more of the case than just him looking of that stepping just up looking, for black oh. musicians. Just looking at that group full of men, uh, I guess Ben Shapiro aside, uh, none of them look like they would have even liked rock and roll. They all look like too old for even that, that they would have been talking about how it was the devil's music and seducing. That's exactly what they would have been like, doing. And yeah. so like when they say rock and roll, I think they mean like Bruce Springsteen. Like, I think they mean like bon John Bon Jovi. I think they mean like Jersey studio rock cop anthems. But like, I don't think they mean like, you know, the Sex Pistols or any like, no. or anything like that. They just, they really just mean like maybe the Rolling Stones. If and, we like, transported them to back then, they would have been in the 50s, like losing their shit over uh, Elvis Presley shaking his leg and saying it was too sexual. That's who they would well, have been. Well, the weird way... Yeah, they, is he says uh, angsty teenage music, which is like, okay, what angsty teenage music was around, angsty white teenage music was around when Obama took office? It's like, follow Obama, point, my chemical romance. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Obama took good Charlotte outside and just shot him like Latin <laughs> or like, gold listen, or something. No more of this, uh, Daughtry. This shit's done. <laughs> we had welcome. We had welcome listen, to the black and we parade, thank and now you. We have a black president. Ah, you took it from me, bro. Got him. Yep. <laughs> I'll just say, listen, draw. the Black Parade means something different now, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough goddamn Red Hot Chili Peppers. Get that shit off my face. <laughs> like, I would just like for them what to like, drop a playlist. They should drop a mixtape. Uh, the Daily Wire, I don't know what, like, I don't know what their little group is called. Uh, they should drop a mixtape. The Backstage Mixtape. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Backstage Mixtape. That sounds pretty all right. Uh, like, put 12 songs on it. I, I want to hear what they think of when they think of rock music. You know what the saddest thing about this clip is? Is right at the beginning where uh, Jeremy Boring says that uh, Obama has killed rock and roll music, and Michael Knowles off camera says, "You have convinced me of this," <laughs> as if it was at some sort of like salon, talking about like um, republicanism versus feudalism or something like that. Like, you have convinced me of this. Oh, just this dumb theory that Obama's said, you can't, don't be angsty white boys. Come on. Like, okay. what, when, it, when did Obama even do that? He existed. They just he, he, right, right. Right. Here's the thing though. Like you, we were mentioning like who they even consider to be rock and roll. And I completely agree with you, Brandon. They're probably thinking of like, you know, the Rolling Stones, the who Bruce Springsteen, and it's like, well, these guys, I mean, I don't, I know Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh are, are younger, but they all have boomer style mentality, right? Like some of those guys look like they could be a boomer age. And like, those are the big artists, what they consider to be rock and roll and rock and roll for them was like, you know, the, the all like the, uh, you know, if you wanted to bother your parents, you listened to those bands, right? Like yeah. those were like you were saying, but newer generations, you know, th different music came around, pop music grew and it became something, you know, they, it, it grew with the times and hip hop and rap became super popular and considered uh, can both continue to evolve with the times. Whereas rock and roll has been stuck in this, like con consistently bringing out these old school acts and like living off the era of these legends. Like when you think of big, big rock and roll groups, those are still the groups you think of. Yes. Yeah, some have like my chemical romance we're talking about have made their way in, but it's still mostly like the big, big arena tours and the big rock acts, those old bands. So, I mean, the idea that that's who they're talking about is hilarious. And also, I mean, that explains why rock and roll died compared to other, uh, you know, musical genres. Rock and roll didn't evolve with the times. It had nothing to do with Obama. Ben I'm Shapiro, trying to... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Ben Shapiro on January 9th, 2012, tweeted out my favorite piece of music, Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis by well, Ralph Vaughn Williams. We, he I, sings and plays the violin or whatever, right? He sings opera. But like, okay, I might be 
going a bit beyond my expertise here, um, but unlike Ben Shapiro, I don't claim to be a classical musician. But Vaughn Williams, I'm pretty sure, is like looked down upon as sort of like a pop classical uh, musician. So I'd be curious to anybody knows about Vaughn Williams can uh, confirm my suspicion that Ben Shapiro is even posing about his classical music bona fides. Music is dead now, honestly, except for rap and Eurovision. And I think I only I have the courage to say this. This is an undisputable truth. Mm. But uh, at the same time, I just think it's interesting that, you know, you can tell that they just, you know, kind of like what Matt was saying, envision themselves in some sort of early 20th century, like Viennese uh, salon with these big ideas and smoking uh, cigars only to come out with like, Obama destroyed anime, you know, and then again, that's like the quality <laughs> of their insight. And then they're like, you know, before Obama, we had like, Fist of the North Star and Dragon Ball Z and you know uh, all of these like shonen boys anime and then after everyone is like going into video games and trying to bang their sister and that's just like you know what Obama did to the genre and it's like okay so it's just clear you don't know anything about not only uh, rock music but music at all or well, but, it, go ahead you've convinced me that way by the way Brandon you've convinced me of that and I mean that he, he feminized anime anything that is not accompanied <laughs> oh God, a viral dance on TikTok is dead yeah. Anything yeah, I, that does not accompany a viral dance on TikTok is dead. I, I mean, that is just such funny uh, analysis to blame a president uh, coming to the office for a whole mu- a g- cultural genre for being put in front of like, it. I, again, I think about Michael doing his Nation of Obama voice. Like, it was clear channel radio, you fucking idiot. Like, that. that's who <laughs> killed rock music. <laughs> like, it wasn't... It wasn't like the president you don't like because you support the other party we're getting so many funny ims about this that i have to read but it also explains though what bands they consider to be rock and roll that they think like obama putting out his as the cool president putting out his like summer playlist that it mostly sucks so bad but it's like mostly consists right right it mostly consists of crappy music but like you know uh you know he throws a few like rock bands on there but it's mostly like, not rock music and like for them it's like oh obama didn't include like the rolling stones and bruce springsteen which actually he probably does but he has that no, they he probably don't know podcast that. series with uh bruce springsteen doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? or it's like yeah oh, I mean, <laughs> but you think they know that you think they know that actually well if they know it it probably like that's what they're saying when he killed rock it's like he's friends with all the musicians that we used to like yeah exactly exactly except they were like you know you know he's hanging out with bruce springsteen and that killed rock i'd be like you know right on man but they're what they mean is like i can't listen to i don't know uh oh my gosh who am i thinking of the one who sings that song uh no uh, what they mean is that like there isn't white cultural hegemony in music in the way that there was when rock and roll existed that's what they mean i I long for the days of screwdriver when uh white music was all the rage (laughs) Um, I got to read some of these. I got to read some of these IMs. Donkey Balls Mike. Rock and roll died when Barack Obama threatened to drone strike the Jonas Brothers. (laughs) Mark Monkey. I really wish that Obama had drone struck Simple Plan. (laughs) Hey, I was just listening to Untitled, and that song holds up, sort of. No. (laughs) Really? Yellow card? Are you kidding me? Red card. I mean, it definitely is still the anthem of white wine. So I, I like I like to play it when they do their little complaining. Uh, I guess how reason, did this happen to me? Uh, I for some to... reason got Obama's voice in my head singing that something corporate song. Like, you could be my punk rock princess. <laughs> like... <laughs> we have somebody saying that Vaughn Williams is not looked down upon in the classical music world. I just thought maybe because that uh, is Ricky Gervais's favorite classical too. Oh, yikes. Uh, Hugh... I'm not reading this. We're tr- they're trying to make me say something. Uh, Rock, yes. Hugh, something after that. Rock and roll was a CIA op to steal from and further destabilize, destabilize and disenfranchise the black community in the United States. That's my favorite conspiracy. Well, I, I, I wouldn't just limit it to the black community, but there are conspiracies, and I don't, I haven't looked into these in depth myself, but it sounds interesting that the CIA basically was at a lot of early uh, rock shows giving out acid in the parking lot, basically, and cultivating ties to a lot of like the, the I forget, the Merry Pranksters in the 50s and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I mean, I think that's a plausible one, actually. Captain No Fun, you heard it here first. Obama invented the Naruto run. <laughs> uh, I mean... I wish, I wish Obama had the courage to put out his like top anime of the summer 2021 list. That would be, that would do wonders from him improving his, I mean, approving me in his run on opposite, approving him in my view. Um, uh, the, I mean, sorry. Right. These on people... Genesis? What? 
No, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Brandon. No, I was just going to say, like, instead, what he did was form a super group of, like, Peter Gabriel, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Bono, and Sting, and now every, like, every white dad is mad that they can't listen to music and be racist anymore. <laughs> um, Sam's sentient tushy hole, gross. Flashbacks to uh, Clinton's sax shredding on Arsenio Hall. Clinton killed jazz. Jay Breezy, Obama killed hente, you know. <laughs> Hentai, hente. Uh, sure. <laughs> I know what that is, but uh, 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 sad. Um, Aaron is not cool. Obama did it all for the nookie, and by nookie, he means he didn't vote for Bernie. <laughs> he means don't vote for Bernie. Sorry. Uh, that was pretty funny. I, I really can't get Obama's voice singing all these songs out of my head now. It's really bad. I'm going to just... <laughs> I need to take a it all for the nookie. <laughs> 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 can anyone pull off Obama voice? Jonathan Davis of Corn doing those noises he would do. Can anyone do that? <laughs> That's a very specific request, but now I can hear that was a sickness. <laughs> Let the bodies hit the floor. Oh boy! He's droning them to the floor. All right. Jesus, that was fun. Um, all right. Actually, I want to do this this old clip here that The Daily Show found. So um, The Daily Show found this old NBC Nightly News clip where they spoke to citizens of this area in Michigan. And I think this is from the 80s, right? Or maybe, yeah, 1984. And they are speaking to them about a... Uh, an ordinance about wearing um, seatbelts and see if you can tell how much this echoes what we're hearing today about masks and vaccines for that matter. It is a new seatbelt ordinance. If the town council gets its way, seatbelts will be mandatory for everybody riding in the front seat of a car through Richland. I'll have to detour the town to get to Kalamazoo. They pass a seatbelt ordinance, but I don't use a seatbelt. I wouldn't wear my seatbelt. I get caught, I get caught, I guess. Florida Highway Patrol Lieutenant Chris Miller hears it all when it comes to seatbelts. I hear it's uncomfortable. Um, it wrinkles my clothes. Uh, it's not cool. There's no freedom no more. <laughs> you don't want to wear it? That's your choice. So oh we could have transplanted that and just take, taken out seatbelts and put masks, and it would be entirely the same as yeah. the conversation we're having today. It's uncomfortable. It's infringing on my freedom. And I, I think, from my perspective, the point to stress here is not that people are stupid, but that there is like covid there was a concerted effort to push uh denial about this from major <laughs> conservative think tanks basically you can still find it to this day they talk about the case against seatbelts from a freedom perspective and Von as Mises. they in 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 coordination with some of these auto manufacturers that didn't want to do this exactly of course and and so like i think it's sort of like how we mistake the lesson for uh the third reich as people got way too excited at rallies and followed a leader it's what are those leaders actually doing to rile up this sort of sentiment because i i know my grandma to this day i don't know if to this day but within like the past few years like still has nightmares about uh getting in a car crash and being unable to get out of it because the seatbelt traps you in the car and that is an explicit scenario that was peddled by these groups to scare people about seatbelts so they it didn't happen to her that's just from it, the propaganda yeah it, it, it never happened to her she's never been in a serious car accident before but she's worried about it because of basically that fear being put into the system by interest groups yeah well, i don't i mean i think that's a deficiency that's still exist to this day where we kind of when we're talking about public opinion don't necessarily account for the vast propaganda campaigns that are out there shaping public opinion about everything from war to supreme court justices to any sort of uh 
uh, consumer issue that we're dealing with at any point in time, because like it's almost taken for granted that companies have the right to engage in these kinds of practices. And so it's sort of just taken, okay, well, if 60% of people think that you shouldn't have to, I guess, recycle. And even if that's the result of like the, I don't know, the trash, big trash or whatever, pushing <laughs> that propaganda, they should only have right to know that the 60% of people believe this as though it's just a natural belief that exists out there and there's nothing that's control, you know, contributing to its rise or uh, its prevalence rather. Right. I mean, and I, it just, it, it goes to show that these kinds of patterns are nothing new and it's like a bit of muscle memory when you can instill fear in people that you can make it all about other things. You can, expand the scope of it and make it you know like the seatbelt thing about this kind of like claustrophobia that we all have and this fear of being unable to get out of a situation and that's what we've done with mass and vaccines vaccines are you know you don't understand the science fully so you you can't know what's going into your body and this could change you because we have fears about health care in this country and with masks oh you make it existential about freedom and control and control over your children masking them and so you expand the fear and then it makes it a lot more personal and um pernicious and you save a few I, years on uh you know regulations and that's money in the bank and more tax cuts and then republicans have Wait, a lot of it's astroturfed, but at least like the uh, echo of grassroots support or the, the the shadings of it, and then they're able to to coast to elections, and now they control a significant majority of state houses in this country. I will say that one guy at least was talking about uh, driving around the town where the seatbelt ordinance was going to go into effect, whereas nowadays uh, the anti-vaxxers would explicitly go in that town to hold whatever. <laughs> protest and try to fly in the face of the rules so we, we did go uh get worse i guess yeah well done <laughs> um ben from chicago obama voice i tried so hard and got so far but in the end it doesn't even matter <laughs> um my name is jonas okay i lost it oh no that, oh, that, was, that was gonna be good that was gonna my be my name good. is jonas <laughs> thanks for all you showed us uh so faking cool matt your Obama impression is really great. I had to listen double take because I swear it was from the soundboard and not an impression. There you go. Impressions, uh, I only know this because um, the person who I sort of modeled my career after, a guy named Matt Morgan, who uh, was a producer for Russell Brand, and I used to think of myself as sort of like Michael's Matt Morgan. Um, he later worked with an impersonator, and because he was working with an impersonator, basically w became able to do all the impressions. And that's basically why I can do some of these too. is Because of Michael? Me and Michael used to just talk as these impressions all the time. That's so great. I'm not going to be as good, but uh, what's with these homies? This is my girl. Why do they got a front? <laughs> um... Leech says, I'm in the car on lunch laughing my ass off, thanks. It was pretty good. Um, voluptuous book deal. Obama not closing Guantanamo Bay is definitely a top 10 anime betrayal. <laughs> Did we lose math? Okay. Um, all right. Well, while he's... Uh, he's muted himself, so we can't take calls. Um, fade away, Jay. Emma, don't forget that Ben Shapiro thinks Barack Obama is also responsible for DAP changing to WAP. Mm. <laughs> Yikes. That was a whole uh, other extravaganza that Ben Shapiro has just like been able to, I guess, uh, escape from the long term uh, clout ramifications of. Very yeah. Embarrassing. Yeah. We, we talked extensively about his, I guess, decision to talk about uh, sexual acts in a really nerdy way yesterday. Um, all we right. We should do the uh, Ruben video, maybe. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. We, again, there's just a lot of funny stuff today. So much content. So much content. So much. And we're here to provide you with that content. We are content machines. All right. So Dave Rubin seems to be pretending to take a shot of tequila after Larry Elder lost. Oh, yeah. This is just Dave Rubin's comedy shops. We're yeah. A look at the Ooh. master dusting off his old skills. And our, our king, DJ Danarchy, put this together for us. Um, and for just 
the general audience to enjoy. I won't even preface it anymore. Take it away, DJ Danarchy. I cannot believe we have to do a show today, guys. This is seriously a freaking nightmare. Like, this is an absolute nightmare. Callie's freaking destroyed. Oh, <laughs> but we'll do it. We got a job to do, right? Like, no matter what, we got a job to do. So, oh my God, this is the good stuff, by the way. Don Julio. You know the Don Julio? Yeah. It's a plug. Let me just. I cannot believe I have to tell people that there's hope, you know? It's just, is this a good bit to do, it's though? Like, you know, like, just day. drinking and what? depressed? That, like... We're live? We're live. Um, hey, uh. hi. How are you? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, September 15th. Yeah, here's the, what Danner can add Oh, I didn't see you there. You caught me mending my fences, one of the many things I do here on the range. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember that, and I wouldn't yeah. have thought to put those two things oh. together. Brilliant. I didn't even realize he was supposed to not be on like that. I just I just thought that it had started, like, you know. He, I mean, like, it, it's obvious he knew that it had started, and he was pretending that he was knocking back shots of tequila. It's got to be, it, like, he's not that stupid to think that he wasn't playing that off. Oh, no, no, I, I get that. That's what he wanted me to believe in after the fact, but it was, you know, displayed so poorly through his own mannerisms. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't pick he up. Didn't sell he it. Wasn't, you know, he didn't sell it. I didn't realize it was supposed to be off air. Yeah, well, he tried to with that maniacal laugh after. I'm so upset about this, as if he has, like, really any emotional attachment to the recall effort in California. Although he did say that he thinks that him and Scott Baio could get Larry Elder to victory, um, as and he'd take that up against, what was the, the other celebrities? Usher, Lauren Hoof, and uh, Priyanka Chopra. I think. Obama, yeah, whatever. But um... I mean, see, the content of that joke is where it really gets let down because that whole act about like, oh gosh, I'm going to drink this and I have to tell people there's hope. Like the funny thing to say in a hot mic situation is to talk shit about somebody and then pretend like, oh, I didn't see it. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've done this on that show before and talk shit about someone that you want to act like you don't want it to get out, but it gets out. That's mm -hmm. funny this I, I think whole, girls. i'm lying to you <laughs> uh i need to drink to do so yeah that's that bit isn't great when does he shoot his show it's like i don't even want to pretend that i'm taking te tequila shots at any point that <laughs> isn't past 7 p.m i also think that was empty down filled with water oh it's f of course water and he's got to like emphasize that it's some fancy tequila too Ooh, Don Julio, that's a good yeah that is again that's like crowder with the um that's like the backstage guys at daily wire that's crowder with the cigar mm -hmm. just lame um performative male adultness right right yeah he uh, dave rubin needed a, a cigar but he didn't want that to come off as too phallic for his the blaze audience he should have been doing a, a bong rip that would have really sold it like because then i would have known that he wasn't supposed to be on air like he should have just been like snorting a line or like doing a bong rip or i don't mm -hmm. know uh, like smoking some Fenty laced weed and just like really tying up his arm. I gotta gotta let these dumb bastards think that they're gonna have any chance of uh, taking back America from the brownies. Gotta go act like these freaking rubes. Uh, I can expose some ideas to them, whatever that means. <laughs> Time to shoot up. <laughs> um, bourbon socialist Dave Rubin pretending to be depressed about a conservative radio host that would vote against Dave's right to be married to his husband would be sad if it wasn't so obviously craven. Wait, was it about um, Norm Dine? I think that's I, I didn't watch Dave Rubin's show. Mm, I, I, no, I assumed it was about the... No, that uh, was about California Larry Elder. Election. Yeah. Fr yeah. Frankly, you know, when oh I, I watched... Oh my God. When yeah, I watched Dave wait, Dave you thought it was... You thought he cared about Norm MacDonald? I mean... Well, I mean, Crowder's, <laughs> Crowder sh made his whole show about Norm MacDonald is really, like, saccharine and lame as hell. But So I thought that's... I, Ruben being a comedy guy, and here he's doing a little comedy skit, I no, assumed it was Norm no, MacDonald. No, I can, I, I can Larry see Elder why... Losing. I can see why you would think that, though, because, like, when I watch Dave Rubin do comedy, I also think of Norm MacDonald. I think of some of the comedic greats. I think Dave Rubin's up there with, like, Dave Chappelle, uh, Richard Pryor... Yeah, or McDonald, George Carlin, you know, I think that, you know, one day little comedians are going to be talking about Dave Rubin. Yeah, he really influenced me to do two shots of tequila before I talking some shit about uh, low, low life GOP uh, loser. Well, we no, should. No, no. That's we have to encourage him to keep going because no. you're right. If Dave doesn't, Dave needs to keep trying at comedy just because he needs to inspire those little young girls and boys. More skits. Right. 
more. Now, Matt, now that you know that Ruben was drinking uh, alcohol because of Larry Elder losing in the California race uh, and having the context of, you know, that that uh, race being so close that Ruben would obviously need to get drunk over that hard fought loss. Does it make a little bit more sense to you now? Yeah. And I just hope he saves some for Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> He should have been drinking a nice, strong American drink like whiskey or, or something. I don't know. I know, like, I know, right? A little bit ethnic for my taste. You get a big thing. If I had to be clear, he should got some grappa or something Greek. Yeah, or you can't get some Kentucky whiskey. It needs to be brown if he wants to pr pr uh, prove his conservative bone in the few days. He should have done like a Jaeger bomb. Just like, oh. <laughs> but that one, that might have been a little bit too intricate, the brown liquor, because he would have had to get the food dye for the water and, you know, maybe he doesn't have right. iced tea in the house. Not not conducive to a quick prop uh, situation. Uh, do people drink Jaeger out here? I always thought that was a Midwest thing. You mean straight? Well, I, I mean, I, Jaeger bombs. I did in high school. But I did like, in college when I was in the Midwest. Yeah, I drank, oh, okay, there you go. I drank a lot of uh, Jaeger bombs, but then you realize, like, actually this stuff, it just tastes like black licorice right yeah and um it isn't that strong so i don't really i just had a like point. my i had a friend that was really into like he was really into guinness and so we sometimes have jaeger bombs but like it's not for me although i do like bitter stuff um, i think jaeger bombs are all right but at the end you got to just clean two glasses and it's just not worth it right <laughs> good point <laughs> Um, you want to take a call, Matt? Sure, let's do it. Let's go to the phones. We'll probably just let's... take two more. All right, let's do it. Let's uh, grab, uh, I don't know, uh, 914. What's your name? Where are you calling from? What's up, guys? This is Ben from New York. Hey, Ben from New York. What would you like to talk about? So uh, I, I noticed something interesting. The prevailing sort of narrative on the left before 2020 was, you know, we can't just run against Trump. We have to talk about policy. We have to talk about, you know, material improvements to people's lives. And it seems like that that strategy kind of failed, right? You know, we it failed really in the primaries. It failed in the general. It doesn't seem like the normie Dems, you know, the people that are turning out for these elections, aside from, you know, movement people, it, it just isn't a, a strategy that really worked out for us. So I noticed that Sam was kind of touting that, um, you know, he likes the strategy that they were uh, trying out in California, where they were tying the GOP to Trump and running against Trump in 2020. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, put a marker on that and, and, you know, see what you guys thought about that, that basically we've conceded that running on policy and running and running for people's material conditions is, is not a, uh, a worthwhile strategy at this point in time, at least. And that running against Trump or running against uh, Trumpism is, uh, you know, the successful strategy that's going to carry us to a, a victory in 2022. So I was wondering what you guys thought about that. I think it's both. Um, I think it's both. But I, I would agree that I think there was a bit of um, maybe hope that didn't turn out that talking about policy and Bernie's policies and how much they're better than Biden's would have an effect. And I, I don't think it had a great effect. And I do agree with the caller. Like, um, look how Castillo beat Fujimori. That was negative partisanship, right? And and I, I feel like negative partisanship is I just if we're comparing the two things. It's it's good to have somebody that you can paint as very scary to the other. That's why, I mean, it was just diabolically stupid that we ran Hillary in 2016. Right. And negative partisanship was also particularly helpful to the Democrats during the coronavirus pandemic, where people's lives were materially affected by the like complete incompetence of the big bad. So it was really like a way to connect those two things. And it also created this bad incentive to vote for biden because people perceived this is the time uh, this is a time to not take risks yeah and i think like the left needs to not be afraid to be i think they need to own like we're the ones who take on the hard right not like you know this being afraid of you're going at republicans too much so you're in the like no i i don't think that's really a concern i think if you show that actually we're the people who take these threats seriously like look at the way uh, Biden and I guess we'll see if the reconciliation gets through, but the w things he promised about being able to keep the party in line, like it was clear that Bernie's um, Bernie's solution was 
probably better in terms of my position in terms of like you need to go at these people like mansion cinema or they're gonna f you and yeah i, I don't know i th- i think um i think the color's right i guess is what I'd yeah say. right i appreciate the yeah, question yeah. though I, I would push back a little bit if only because i don't know one more go ahead one more uh Oh, go ahead, Brandon. Sorry. I would just say I would think I would say, you know, the lesson from the primary necessarily in my mind wasn't that clear cut, if only because it wasn't really the as though Bernie wasn't sufficiently anti-Trump or tying him to the GOP or as though any of the other primary candidates who were only pushing an anti-Trump message did particularly well over Bernie's. In the end, it seemed as though, you know, there was a failure in the analysis of what was going on in those primaries by mainstream media to accurately paint that picture for, for like the people who weren't watching it directly or who were already being inundated with uh you know the propaganda that joe biden was inevitability and he was like by um obama's successor etc cetera, etc cetera. because at the end of the day joe biden didn't really say anything to get mm-hmm. that position he didn't do he didn't like run anti-trump he barely said anything yeah. until he was like to- until people were told to vote for him so i think there's more of a lesson about you know maybe the message matters less than how we get it out and if we're able to be define our narratives for ourselves yeah, I think that's a good point. Appreciate it. Uh, appreciate uh, so it, ben. One Thank more, you. one more, one more, one more quick thing. So I just wanted to say I love the thir- Thursday shows. You guys are doing a great job, and I didn't realize until you guys were all back in the studio how much I missed and how much it adds to the show of just hearing Matt's uh, off camera, off microphone laugh. Yeah, and, uh, it's just great to have you guys uh, back and and hear Matt and and Matt's really stepped up his comedy game with the impressions and uh, I just want to say you guys are doing a great job and appreciate uh, all the shows and you guys getting us through. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know what they're saying, Matt Lex are just getting better and better at comedy. That that's many a, people are saying. That's a fact. That's a that's have a play a day, on that. And the not mats uh, are nervous. That, that prison planet tweet, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, about that's now. what I said. And yeah, the yeah, not yeah. mats are getting nervous. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take one final call. All right, let's do it. Let's uh, take this call right here. Random number. This person's been on for a while. Uh, 647, what's your name? Where are you calling from? 647, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Clayton, calling from Toronto. Hey, uh, what would you like to talk about? Um, well, I have two embarrassing confessions to make. Go ahead. The first of which, um, oh, I'm going to embarrass myself, man. The first of which is um, a pretty big fan of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. And the second embarrassing, uh, yeah, the second one's much worse. Like, I used to be a pretty big fan of Joe Rogan. That's not that bad. And um, You You could have said Dave Rubin. Well, you know what, man? Like, for the first time. Uh, you're, cu- uh, you're, cutting, you're out. cutting out. You're cutting out. Okay, sorry, guys. I don't know what happened there. Uh, we did get the, the Canadian sorry at the end there, which is yeah. all worth it. Should I take another, or should we just? What do you want? We'll to just do? take. We'll take one more. Yeah. All right. Eight one eight. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's uh, Oxygen uh, from Italy. I am. Um, what you say, the girlfriend of Michael Tracy. I'm as pleasant as a breeze. <laughs> and as about as transparent. <laughs> so, uh, but jokes aside. Uh, um, hi guys, how are you guys doing? I didn't know that <laughs> I didn't know that Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend listens to this show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling in. <laughs> Anything you'd like to tell us about? <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, I was going to go into... You, you had a discussion about, like, radicalism. Sorry. Um, Hi, Dave from no. Jamaica. How are you? Um, de-radicalization. Yeah? I just want everyone to know this. Can you hear if, me? if they couldn't tell, this is Dave in Jamaica. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of okay with accents as well. But, yeah. <laughs> so, you were talking... I, you had a show yesterday where you're talking about um, de-radicalization versus reaching out. Right, right. And... I guess I I want to get into the topic because I'm a little bit frustrated with the discourse. Uh, you have spoken well about it. I tend to agree with you. Well, I think people are category categorizing things very badly, right? Like your conservative uncle who might believe in a good thing and then he might believe in three horrible things is completely different from like a Nazi, right? 
And I do, and I think people do understand how de-radicalization takes a long time and it's not mm-hmm. something everybody should do, right? Right. It's like, how can I explain? It's not up to Jewish people to de-radicalize Nazis. Right. Kind of like it's not up to black people to de-radicalize um, KKK members because, one, it's not going to be very particularly effective right. because when you come to de-radicalization, it takes a long time and usually it involves people in that community who mm-hmm. they trust, right? Mm-hmm. Who, who, it's ve- very rarely do you have outsiders de if you want to do that, fine, but it's, I don't. I think people have a very naive view of these type of things. Right? Absolutely. For people, for people who don't understand the context, on my episode of my show last night at uh, youtubecom slash uh, I watched that uh, that that conversation slash debate slash heated talk between uh, Brianna of uh, the B- Bad Faith and Talia, who wrote uh, Culture Warlords, uh, that book about uh, you know going undercover and white supremacist organizations online. And, you know, there was a whole controversy online about it because Brianna was really pushing for de-radicalization to build, you know, in order to build a multiracial left coalition. And Talia is against that, obviously, for that purpose, uh, because de-radicalization takes time. It's on an individual level. You know, you can't uh, you can't, you know. Take and that. she has a lot of experience in this area, given right. like her investigative reporting and long right. work in this field specifically. Right. And you can't take that and multiply it by in the numbers you need to for it to actually be anything substantial. And yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. Like on my show, I talk about the radicalization, but it is always on that personal level. Like I never talk about. Oh, if you could de-radicalize someone, uh, we're on our way to building a strong movement on the left. No, that's just ridiculous to think that way. Uh, if you de-radicalize someone on just on a personal level, you're probably like helping that person in relationships in their personal, in their real life. Like that's basically what you're doing, which is a worthwhile, valiant effort if you're friends with somebody, but you can't expect people who you know don't have that connection to be able to put in the work to do that. Um, so they're really, you know, de-radicalization in terms of, you know, a movement building tool, right? I, I just don't see how it works to scale. No, I can give you a classic example, like, um, in Jamaica, right? We have the homophobia issue, right? right. One of the worst things people have outside pressure tried to change that has backfired spectacularly it entrenches positions, right? If for that thing to change in Jamaica, it has to come within Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Sadly enough, it might not be fast enough for people's pleasure, right? But it's just the nature of the, it's the nature of humans work when it comes to changing their minds and stuff, right? You're not going to just trust an outsider. It's just the nature of the thing. And that's kind of what I want to focus on. I think people need to have a more realistic view of it, of how de-radicalization works. You know, absolutely. categorizing yeah go ahead sorry and it's always it's always bizarre to me the focus on spending time on people who are deep in the right to for some reason we need them to build this leftist movement this multiracial coalition on the left whereas like just look at how many people just didn't vote in 2020 if you want to even look at it like the purpose obviously is to build some sort of electoral base right Look at how many people just didn't vote in 2020, people who didn't care to come out, who are basically probably for the most part a blank slate that you could actually talk to and not have to deprogram them. You just have to get them to care or to reach out to them and make them understand your, you know, why your ideology would be, uh, you know, would help them in their everyday life. There's no need to go through the motions of trying to convince someone who hates you and what you stand for to join you when there's perfectly good people who are just like, hey, uh, you know, I could be open to this if you just come and talk to me. Yeah. Just to jump in here quick, I think Mm -hmm. you make a great point, Matt, and uh, thank you for the call, Dave. Uh, The first point, you know, the Matt's point, I think when you're online, and I can't speak to any particular conversation that I didn't see, I think it's easy and you see a lot with people who are trying to make uh, content on YouTube, trying to make content online, generally speaking, of wanting to activate a market that already exists. So like, yeah, if you have a market of people who are contributing to right-wing Patreons, it and, you know makes more practical sense to try to convert them to take paying for your Patreon than to get someone to like start a whole new Patreon from nowhere to start doing like 
donations, right? So that non-voter to voter, you know, that non-voter to voter uh, category is a lot easier to sell for an organizer, but from like a marketing uh, product standpoint, people who are already paying for something like that are going to be willing to pay for something else. So like, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily map one to one like yeah it makes more sense to go after non-voters if you're looking for like actually making change then it makes then it makes to go after people who already have an ideology but that's not what we're talking about and the second point i would just say you know uh i think people who work in the field or rather work in fields where talking or writing or words and expression in and of themselves are like both the tool and the goal like writing articles or having podcasts or talking overvalue the worth of actual the, the the worth of discourse and the worth of language and changing people's minds who don't necessarily navigate worlds where that's both a tool and like an art and uh you know in the so product so i think you know when we talk about stuff like what words get you canceled or what's going on in like the world of the new york times we're not necessarily talking about the same population of people who you know, are going, we're going to be talking to when you go out looking for non voters people who like, yeah, you know, they don't want you to say racist things to them, but they're not necessarily looking for you to use the, like the most up to date terms. So there's a little bit of middle ground there. And so I think when you're talking about people who, mm -hmm. you know, exist in the world of words and rhetoric and discourse and writing, they just want to believe way more than is true, that those things matter to everyone as much as they matter to them. Like presentation I in that sense is just not as important. That's that's great points, and I just want to you know take the, your first point one step further. That you know the idea that it's easier to bring people who are already, you know, paying for political content over to your side so they can pay for your political content is, is a fantastic point. But I also want to add to that that it's not even so much bringing them to your side. It's just basically you're telling those people without maybe even changing their mind at all that you value them. So they're like, oh, if I you know. Oh, thanks. Someone on the other side values me. I'm going to throw down some cash, let them know that I, I see they're reaching out to me, regardless of the fact that they haven't swayed me. I see that they value me. So here's some money because it's not, oh, you're not going to win all those people over. Uh, I, I mean, and I, I don't want to make be misunderstood. I think you I think, bring oh, up a good point. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Dave, please. Oh, I, I, you bring up a good point. Um, I, I, you, I remember the, you, is it a blues magician, Daryl Davis? And he, he famously goes out and tries to de-radicalize clans members. Right. During the Black Lives Matter protest, those guys reactivated, right? <laughs> they backslid. And he got in a lot of issues with Black Lives protesters because he would go out and try to post bails for some of the more violent actors that hurt people in the BLM movement. What I'm trying to say is, it's as I say, it's a long process. And you tend to have a couple of situations where you go one step back, sorry, one step forward and six steps back, right? So I'm, as I said, it's not an effective way to deal with ex political extremists like that. Usually, it's a it's a thing that a society should focus on, but I don't see it as a valuable political strategy in of itself because Absolutely. of how long it takes. And I actually had not heard about that. That's, that where did you hear about oh, that's incredible. That's I mean, it's not surprising, but it's still incredible. To see yeah, I think it's the, called the, the the fact that his uh, the people he deradicalized fell the back into it. Curious case of Daryl Davis or something like that. I have to check that out. I think right? the article was the curious case of Daryl Davis or something like. That. But he, but it's not surprising to me because it kind of reminds me of like addiction or anything else. It's it's not a straight line forward like and. Also, as you were saying, it's a it you get into a weird situation where you become the okay black guy to mm -hmm. these people, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I, just I mean, all that. they need is a a little trigger, and they're they're getting the same habit. I mean, that's the thing. Modern modern day ahead, fa no. like fascism is updated with the time. It's modern day fascism isn't so. I mean, black and white, uh, they are, you know, fascists, mm -hmm. white supremacists, neo-Nazis are quite open to the idea now that to give them cover, there are right wing, uh, you know, people of color, people in the LGBT community who are willing to join up with them and they'll be happy to use them to try to get what they want and eventually mm -hmm. obviously be rid of them as quickly as uh, they they invited them to join them, you know? The Exactly. 
So I mean, we have Enrico. No, Ta- I'm not Enrico, a perfect Enrico team. Tario. He's not irredeemable or anything. Well, I mean, right. sorry. I think. Go ahead. I, just to add to your point about not being irredeemable, I would say, you know, just to find a bit of a middle ground so before I come across as too like exclusionary. That like it's not to say you shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to exist in left wing organizations with the understanding, not you know, neo Nazis, obviously, but you know, people who are trying to reform themselves genuinely shouldn't be allowed to exist in mainstream uh, left spaces. You know, they just shouldn't be centered. Like, I just don't yeah. think there's any reason to center people who have just come to that side. And from a other standpoint, I think, you know, just because of our individualistic big man theory of change, I think people who are trying to lead these sort of like, you know, populations of listeners trying to infiltrate these corrupt organizations, you know, any number of things where they view themselves as being a, an agent of change are just not used to thinking of themselves as being also one that could be changed by what they're trying to do, right? It's a very, very, I think, you know, myopic, egocentric way of thinking about identity that, okay, well, I'm going to influence all of these people. I'm going to navigate all of these systems. I'm going to like add this influx of right-wingers to my audience. And these ideas that they're bringing are not going to change the ideology of the, et cetera. It's not going to change me. It's not going to change the, you know, the population or be any reflection on me. I think that's, you know, easy to believe in a world where we don't really have a good like grip on those things or, you know, because we're so uh, tied to this idea of radical agency that, you know, people, you know, take it very offensively when, or get rather, they get very offended when you imply that, well, okay, well, maybe, you know, having all of these right wingers in your audience is going to change how you cover things because you're looking for that sort of positive feedback from them as well. Right. Dave, really appreciate the call. Oh, well, I guess I'll leave, with, I'll leave with one message before I go um, for Michael Tracy. So, oxygen atmosphere. I want to say the first time I met Michael Tracy, he saw right through me. So there you go. All right, later, guys. <laughs> it's almost like you're translucent. All right. All right, we're going to read a few IMs and then uh, get out of here. I'm going to hang up on Dave. Sorry, guys. It's the final call of the day. I'm hanging um, up too. Between the 101 and the 5, I personally knocked on thousands of doors for uh, in L.A. for Bernie, and most of them were on doors of families and people who had checked out altogether. Most, if not all of them, were really open to Bernie, and many had never been spoken to by political campaigns. That was the strategy here. There's always a way to reach them as long as we were able to connect with them personally. That is the only way forward. I think, yeah, that's probably a better message. Like, in terms of uh, how or what we say to people, it's how we say it and on their front door is probably the best place. Um, yeah. Uh, H-Dub, it's also... Sorry? I'm going to say in many ways, that's how Obama overcame Hillary. He had people yep. going around the South with those tablets showing, <laughs> showing them what, you know, she was doing. And like, you know, at the time it seemed silly, but like that kind of thing, that face-to-face interaction is what people were missing. They were just being told that he, or they were being told nothing at all about him, basically. Yeah. Um, H-Dub, it's also very unlikely to de-radicalize somebody that you do not have a personal relationship with. I think you guys touched on that, but that's very true. Um, there is a bit of a narcissism and arrogance that I think, you know, Brandon, you mentioned too, that is imbued in those conversations or embedded in them. Although Um, this show has uh, helped de-radicalize notably, uh, Caleb Kane and, uh, perhaps others. So, um, this show kudos to us. Yes. If uh, if de-radicalization is what you're after, majority report, baby. Right. But you also have to assume that uh, those people are on, in different levels of how deep they've fallen. Like, you know, if you're you're leading uh, in home uh, white supremacist meetings uh, with a biweekly KKK meeting, the, the a YouTube channel is probably not pulling you out. Shane from Canada, the far right anti-immigrant party in Canada has immigrants running in it. It also has a guy trying to build uh, a semen retention army. So that's a thing in the world. Ew. Um trans sister rodeo we're just going to do three more bill clinton's 1996 telecommunications act not only killed rock and roll but it really helped to shred the music industry media mergers had already started under reagan but that act really kicked the mergers into high gear this is an interesting point you can see a lot of the independent artists of the early 90s disappear by the late 90s and sadly all that was left was the dude bro new metal num new metal new metal, new new metal. metal. Uh, that was more easily marketed to the young, angry white males <laughs> at the time. Wait, new I, I, get, I get this confused. I, so I get a drug. Confused which one is which one is new metal and which one's post grunge? Because I think post grunge are bands like Creed and bands that sound like Creed. So yeah, you know, like Nickelback is post grunge, and then mm-hmm. new metal is like Linkin Park and uh, like stuff like that. Corn, I didn't even know, no, no post grunge is like Bush, right? I would know if I called Nickelback. 
post grunge. They're like post post. Nickelback's like pop rock. Um, still got the, the gravelly. Oh. Yeah, it's still uh, speaking of Daughtry you now. It's wow. in my head. Matt Bender just killed rock and roll again. Um, Fierce Deity, this discussion reminds me of how Bruce Springsteen used to completely ice out Chris Christie and then they worked together one time for Hurricane Sandy and Springsteen hugged him and Chris Christie cried. <laughs> Uh, Ryan Cole is an ex a researcher for an expert witness in the automobile industry negligence case and the industry overwhelmed us with boxes of paperwork including depositions from the 1930s on the dangers of seatbelts pushing all of the lies that we have heard and the final I am of the day white communist MR team that was an enlightening 15 minute segment on white names makes me nostalgic for all those 80s comics channeling the apartheid treason in American audiences with genius radical bits like black people be like this, but white people be like that. Or the giddy, I don't know why this is the final I am, or the giddy days of the 1931 Berlin cabaret with smug, obvious little racial tension bits. It, this seems to be a criticism. Um, like the me... Yah Hans was such an Aryan name. How about Heinrich? So Aryan. My name is Aryan too. Claiming some names as white names without examining the race constructs and segregation implicit probably feels like a dy feels dystopian to the 14 year old so called black kid named Bradley. Frankly, I, I think you're taking it a little go. seriously. <laughs> Frankly, I I remember when growing up, you know, everyone was like every black person's named Tyrone and Sharkeisha. People are gonna be begging for it to be named Tyrone in 20 years. <laughs> you know. And we will leave off with that. Uh, Brandon, Matt, Matt. Bradley, thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. One an, another fun Thursday. We will Absolutely. see you all tomorrow. Peace. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. I lost my drive